Hi everyone, you're listening to the Via Lucci podcast, uncensored and completely unedited discussions about life and everything in it. We hope you enjoy the show. Right, so before we get on, hello everyone. Hi. Hello, John. Hello. Right, we're going to get to it, but just before, <laughs> well, I wanted, we were talking about photographic memories beforehand, so I'll just say this quickly, Charles. Um, there's a sort of documentary on it, and they went to speak to people that had the photographic memories and all that, and this is about, about the late 80s. And they spoke to a woman and they said, she had a photograph memory and they went to her and they sat with her and they said, right, they're just going to give her random days and times from like, it wasn't every decade, but something like that. So 2.30, 1967, blah, blah. And she went, oh, I had the thingy socks on. Then my mum was wearing the thing. I went downstairs and the TV was on and there was a guy and he'd robbed a thing and he was a thing and blah, 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 wearing the things and the cords. And then he went back to, and I went, yeah. Like she, she passed the TV in the, at that day on that time, a guy had robbed in the news program. And they went through all of them. I'm thinking, think that. Yeah. And this isn't like a lunatic with a giant brain. That's what the brain but can the do. The brain can do it. Yeah. Because I took a statement of a guy, someone yes. stole a boat and they took it down to Spain. And, uh, and I was looking into stolen boats at the time. And this guy I managed to get him and he said, I remember everything. So I've got photographic memory. I went, well, come in, do a statement. And he said, yeah, but it's a bit difficult because I have a photographic memory. I went, no, no, that's brilliant. Come went, nearer to that. He goes, no, it's not. And he, he was Why? saying he was going down the motorway and he said, this car went by. He said, the number plate was so-and-so. Then this number plate was this. And then this number plate was this. He remembered every number plate. He remembered every single word of every program he'd ever. He said, name a film. Yeah. And I will tell you every word that's said. In I that. don't know what it's not. A, it's a, there's no psychosis that comes along with it, is it? They seem not. There's no problem. It's just it just goes to show what how marvelous the brain is. Look at that. Think of every. Yeah. That it's, it's. I don't know whether or not could you. Is that because something could be used professionally? Well, like taste buds and things, and knows what you smell. You can use that. What memory? But when, when you get into the satanic ritual abuse and the mind control element comes in, they do use it. For what reason? Um, Briefly, I mean. Well, well, they use it to control people's minds, and they they use code wording where they can literally switch someone off and switch them on, and then they can bring in different alter characters, different personalities, right? And they can also be running parallel in the same mind, and be switched on and switched off with no memory, right? Yeah, and, and no taste, no smell, and it's it's it, it, it's wrong. I got told off by saying it, but it's a fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I sat. Like I said before this, I sat for seven hours with a guy two days ago, a survivor of the most appalling abuse I've ever heard in my life. But he is a, a victim of mind control and he was telling me exactly how they do it. I spoke to a guy that used to do hypnosis. Um, I don't want to say too much about him, but, but anyway, so he did hypnosis on the stage, one of those fellas, and he did a lot of competitions, like on he'd be on TV. All oh, right. He said, he said, I'm not smart. He said, I've just got a really good memory. So it's not personal, I'm not great. He said, but I've got a good memory. So when they ask me things, I can say, well, that's the bloke that did the thing. And they said, but don't ask me anything about them because I've got a clue. I could just remember stuff. In fact, Stephen Fry says that. He said, he said if people think I'm smart, he said, I've just got a I can remember things when I've seen them. So he regurgitate a lot. That, that is a, a straight gear. Yeah, what's, uh, what's the split between having being sort of good yeah. cognitive powers and being able to sort of think on your feet and also having good memory. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because like, if you can't, if you remember it, if you're reading lots of, lots of very intelligent things, lots of facts and figures and yeah. stuff and you can't remember a damn thing, like yeah. me. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Not that I do read a lot, but yeah. I, I can't remember anything. So like, it's almost pointless. But, but, but where, where it's used is that, is it a memory or is it trauma or is it a false memory or is it not? And so, so when they attack them legally, these survivors that have been through the most appalling abuse, they'll say things, it's a false memory syndrome, where it isn't, but there, there, there is so much trauma attached to that episode. Oh, yeah, if you're talking about that type of memory. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah, yeah. You, you know, and, and so, the, so how it works is that no one knows where memory is stored, but it's not stored in one place, because if you had a, a whack there, yeah. you, you'd forget everything. But memory, you've got muscle memory, you, you, you've got... Your, your fingers how they pick yeah. that up what that tastes like and all that but then you've got trauma but you do need an element of trauma it's a bit like judgment they say it's wrong to judge no it isn't we all judge everyone is judgmental every time a woman gets on a train at night to go home on her own she judges everyone in that carriage mm. 
because she knows where she wants to sit. When you walk home, wherever or whatever, you're going to judge your environment. That's how we survive. Yeah. If you don't, it's pure recklessness. Yeah. It's crazy. So when they go on about their judgmental, well, well, that's idiotic. Of course, we are naturally judgmental. We have to do it. You know. I wonder if when the memories kick in. Oh, that's, I mean, it's a really philosophical question. When does memory? But but the, the problem is is that when, when something majorly traumatic occurs, you can't have that at the paramount of your thinking because you wouldn't get out of bed. So it has to be stored away. Yeah, I had an accident when I was a kid. I got pulled under the blades of a tractor, like ripped up one side of my leg. Yeah, oh yeah, no joke. Like put, I pulled under. I only went under half. I think my shoe jammed the bloody thing. I've got no memories whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Nothing. But they're there. Yeah. If I smell grass yeah. and like oil, like if it, when the council are cutting the grass, yeah, yeah, yeah. something in me goes off. But the other thing, when that memory is accessed, for whatever reason, it will be in infinite detail. Yeah. And that's how it works. You know? Because I, I've got flashes right. and the flashes, I can remember what I was staring at and what I saw. And I can remember being at the hospital and I remember the eyes of the doctor. Do you know what I mean? like, again, so it's like, it's weird. I suppose, I suppose it, yeah, I was going to say, I suppose it, in, in a way it's like how you sort of tend to remember more the, the good things about something. You know, I don't know, you go on a holiday, you know, and you remember the positives are here and there and you sort of slightly forget the worst bits yeah. or you remember a job. Well, it's you human remember nature. A job, yeah. You, you wouldn't remember, survive if you remembered yeah. all bad stuff. Yeah, you, but, so this defense mechanism, yeah. isn't it, for your brain, your psyche? You know? But what you have, especially it, the field I was in, I had to interview people both victims and suspects that made us different from solicitors because they, they were biased to their, their yeah, client, right. you know, um, you know, they had a subjective a, a approach, you know, but when you're interviewing someone, especially a suspect, you'd be looking for nonverbal indicators and also with the victims and with a victim, they would distance themselves from an event. So that is a major event, for example, right? So you will get, in, in in extreme um detail what they were doing before this event they would tell you you know what color shoes they had on what this what it smelled like the cut grass and all that you know and all of a sudden i i met this man and then they'd skip straight over it yeah and then you'd have to bring them back well hang on go back to yeah. back to this man but then all of a sudden what you're doing you're taking them back there and you'll get things like they call it sharp intake of breath yeah. and they're back there so I would always get a bit of the paper and I would used to get someone to say, draw the scene. Because we don't think in numbers. We, we think in pictures and images. That's how our brain works. Yeah. You know, these analytical people must struggle <clears throat> because years ago, everything was symbolism. So the shops would have it. The three balls were pawn breakers. The, 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 the what they call the um, bandages for the um, barber oh, shops, yeah. you know, and things like that. We, we dream. We don't dream in numbers and binary codes. We we dream in events. Because that's how, mostly how we process information, these sort of visually and all well, Even yeah. pubs with the pub signs. Yeah. They weren't written, were they? They were the signs. They were signs, yeah. yeah. But but and also things our dreams are allegorical. Um, because if if they were truthful, it would freak us out. So so that's what you do. but when when you get someone to start committing to a paper, all of a sudden you, there is this pause and these memories start coming back and you can actually see them they're coming back and you, you see their body language, you know, and they, they'll start curling up and things like that. And you've got to keep them there yeah. because that's where the memories are. Yeah, yeah. And then bang, the memories hit them. They start getting the smells they get, right, yeah. and you start getting the trauma and all of a sudden they're in that moment. Well, yeah, talk, it's, it's tough making people, I suppose, uh, having to relive awful moments like that. But, but, but it's you, a skill yeah. and, and you've got to do it in such a way that you're not leading them because the moment you lead them, the court will throw that out. Yeah, very true. Yeah. You know, and what you've got to understand, especially with children, children acquiesce. So children will want to please. Yeah. Right. So you might, you might know that that car was red that picked them up and they went, a blue car picked me up. So you can't say, was it a red car? They'll just go, yeah. Oh, that, that's a closed question. Yeah, okay. That's a leading question. Right, yeah. That will get your evidence. You will smart. You screw your evidence. So you say, what was the color of the You ask four questions. Tell me. Tell me what happened. Yeah. Tell me about today, right? And they'll tell you. And they'll give you a, a brief summary, a pricey of the day. And in that summary will be the topics you needed. I went out with my friend. Oh, yeah. We went out and it, this thing happened with the car. Again, this thing happened with the car. 
So you, you look at the pronouns as well. What pronouns you? What tense is used? You can get a lot of dishonesty from someone's tense right, okay, yeah. as well. Uh, I'm maybe later I'll give an example of exactly how I used that the other day. And and then from that you work out the topics of friend. Who is this friend? We need to know everything about this friend. This car. We need to know absolutely everything from start to bit. What make it was? What color it was? How it smelled? The whole lot. Nothing out. Where was they? Exactly where was? What do they remember? What could they see? What time of day? So it's it, it, it's provable lies, checkable facts. Yeah. Um, so then you'll say, well, that's okay. You spoke about your friend. So four questions. Tell me. Tell me about your friend. What does friend even mean? And this this is very clever because an adult has to build up trust, especially someone who's come from trauma. It'll take a long time before they call someone a friend. A child, especially a child that comes from neglect, anyone's their friend. If an ice Black cream child, man yeah. gives them an ice cream, gives them that, mm -hmm. they'll say, that's my friend. Yeah. So what a child says is a friend is right. different to what yeah, an adult yeah. says is a friend. So you have to quantify that. Yeah. And and we do this because lawyers are tricky. Right. Okay, yeah. You know, I, and I've, I know some good lawyers, but some of them, I think, well, you know, when the, the day's done and you've earned your money up people's misery, seriously, and if I upset a lawyer, that's a good one. I apologize. But there are a lot that, that, are, yeah. that are unscrupulous people. So, and then you've got to say, explain. Explain that, you know. You get things like, well, what happened? Oh, he sexed me, right? Now, we're living in a time where illiteracy is it's all level high, you know. We put our standards. I was brought up in the 70s. I went through the education system of the 1970s. Like everyone who went to my school, and I went to a Catholic school, we've got impeccable handwriting. You look at people the now. Handwriting, the handwriting. Yeah. Like, they, they haven't got handwriting. That, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> I, I can barely read mine now. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's just straight some But back then, we were beaten and we were beaten because they could beat us then. They could hit us yeah. if we didn't have neat handwriting. And, and our structure, our diction was good. But now, and we've got street slang. You know, London is the most diverse city in the world. I had, I had one woman thought a blowjob was two men fighting. <laughs> and she said to me, well, she was a social worker. That's and she said, oh, well, oh, she was an adult, yeah. an adult with a job. Yeah. yeah she's yeah. an adult, a social worker. And a kid has dis uh, 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 disclosed that a man made a, of a blow job. And she, and she said, well, uh, that's it. He said, sometimes children do hit each other or they hit men. And I'm like, are you for real? But she <laughs> was from, she was from East Africa and she, she didn't know the yeah. term blow job. I told her it was actually, that was called a fisting. <laughs> 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 But, Send her on her way with yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But but again, you got to quantify it. What do you mean? Tell me. Explain that. Describe. Yeah. Describe it. You know. Describe what 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 you think is one thing is something else. You know. It, it's it's such a big spectrum, and you've got to narrow it down. Yeah. And the ultimate one: show show me. And it doesn't physically mean someone has to punch you, but it might mean that they have to. Well, how, how, show me. Yeah. I'll stand up. Show me how yeah. they hit you or. Pen and paper, show me. Yeah. But the problem now is that there, there are a lot of children with very poor education. Yeah. Especially when, when they haven't been at school or they've been out. So well, the whole thing of what the slang used to be is now the main, like the, the cutting corners right. language-wise. But that affects the brain. People don't talk about well, this. The shortening of the language shortens the brain as well. Well, well, of course, and, and, and if you narrow someone's vocabulary, you narrow their way of expression. Yeah. So they can't express themselves. Mate, because I, I, I come from bad back. I remember I, over a decade I had to educate myself, and I remember listening to radio and not being able to follow, like Radio 4, yeah. and not being able to follow what they were talking about because every third, fourth sentence, I didn't know what that word was, so I used to have to write them down over years. And it's only now when I go back later, go, it is like a different language. And if you're locked out that, so people that I now know that I used to know years ago, I'm not being horrible. Sometimes I think they've only, they've only got a few words that they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is grunting and noise and what and that and foot and what's that and dirt. And you go, but you're locked out. You're I, actually locked out. I, I had to um, interview a, a traveler mm -hmm. girl, right? And she'd never been to school. And she was the youngest victim we had, right? At the time, she was nine. And what they put her through was probably the worst 
uh, of all the girls. Do they? The, 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 the grooming gangs, pimping oh, gangs, right. whatever we, we want to call them. This is a, sorry, should explain it. This, this was a, a victim of, 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 of child prostitution as well. And we needed to know, we needed to know where this went on. Um, so I gave her a map and she said, I can't read or write, John. Yeah. I said, but it's a map. She said, yeah, but to you, that is like a photograph, but to me, it's still like writing. Yeah. And I was like, I get you. Yeah. I get you. So we had to go on the street with her and drive around in Physically cars do that. with a camera filming. Oh, That's right. how we did it. We did the interview in a in a car filming it. Right. So we 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 haven't forgotten. We're going to go back to last week's show. Yeah. So, so we ended it. So you'd been to you uh, the River Police. You'd been on the canals. Yeah. You got your nice award from what year was this? I'm trying to picture. About 2001. That was uh, using. There you go. Look at young John. Look at that. Uh, that was me. That, How old were you there, John? That, 12? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if only. Oh, look at his yeah, face. Look. It's so, oh, that it was works. a few waist sizes ago as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I ended up, I got about nine commendations I got nice. throughout my, uh, but uh, you'd, you'd get a lovely, they'd take you, your family, they'd give you dinner and alcohol. There'd be loads of alcohol and there'd be bottles of wine with Met Police on it. Oh, know? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loads of them. <laughs> They've got their own, and, got their own brand. Yeah, yeah they yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. And and what used to happen is the catering staff would, there'd be crates of it. And they'd only put like three bottles out. Right. Yeah, and they'd, yeah. they'd nick it. But hang on. Why have they got their own wine? Why not just, why are they not buying wine? Well, it, it, it they've got their own, it, it probably is. they They've right. obviously got a contract or something. They haven't got their own vineyard. Oh, you know? <laughs> they probably just slap. A, they probably got someone slap. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, anyway, so you, uh, the river police. You moved the river police. You you did the thing on the river boat, the boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Canals. You did that. You went to somebody. You wanted to then. You you heard that there was no problems with ha um, crop I was tracking Haringey. down the paedophiles. Yeah. You said I want to look into this because they're saying someone said to you there's no problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And you looked into it and they went, oh, for Christ's sake, gone to the West End, I believe. No, you yeah. we, you went part. You well, went, we are, yeah, I've, 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 I was in because you were about in, to, in the West yeah, End. Yeah, that's it. I, and you were going to phone around. You were going to look into the Harrogate. But, but, but I've now moved from the West End. Now I've been threatened. Yeah. With the loss of my home, my children, yeah. and yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, my job. Uh, so I then asked. To carry on working with children, yeah. Because um, for, for the first time, I realised this makes a difference. <laughs> I knew then that you know that when children are, are affected at such a young age, and this is what causes criminals. It, it is this is a machine that makes criminals, and you know you don't need a, a doctorate in criminology to understand that. I mean, I'm listening now to. to people giving speeches about, you know, crime and, and you've got the Minister of Justice to think, I mean, I could have told them that for nothing, for a tenner. It, it's a no-brainer. Now, I turned up at the um, the Child Abuse Investigation Unit for the London Borough of Haringey, uh, which become infamous for Victoria Columbia. So this office I went to had a history. So they had the Victoria Columbia case, which was a little um, West African girl who was basically tortured to death. Rings I, I, bell. Yeah, the name rings a bell. Yeah. Could you, uh, well, yeah, you, the, the, the image of her is this sweet little uh, black girl with her hair in bunches, you know, in a little dress. And it was her um, so-called uncle and aunt who, who tortured this poor little soul to death. And there was a ritualistic element to some of that as well. So that came out of this office. And later on, and I was involved in this, was the Baby P case. More, oh, rings more no, uh, P. notorious. Um, Baby P, the, the little boy that was um, tortured by the mother and her boyfriend to death. Baby P, that was a yeah. big story. And, and the mother, and the mother, they're, they're going to release. There's just been a massive campaign on the press that she shouldn't be released. Yes, that's yeah, that's yeah. why that's been. Yeah, because there's been a couple recently as well, and and then that she because she served a bit of time, but then they were yeah. releasing it. Yeah. yeah. Now, now I was involved. In that. I actually interviewed the mum, and I used my interview skills there. And um, for my efforts, she spat in my face. <laughs> They call me a see you next Tuesday. But what that, was you speaking to her about? What was you trying uh, to... About injuries to a kid. I mean, I'll get to that and I'll, I'll show you it because as a result of that, that, that interview, I was then sort of handpicked to uh, teach interview skills. And I oh. went on to teach interview skills to police forces around the world. Um, and there, there was a, a skill to it. There was a lot of neuro-linguistic programming, yeah. profiling. It was a fascinating way. And it was just something that, I was naturally good at. I've got 
you know, some people, they're good boxers, they're fast on their feet, they're, they're good athletes. Yeah. Mine was communicating and it still is. It's so, so if we go back to the when you were, you were going to phone up, you looked yeah, right. at her and go. Right, so, so how it works is I go in, there's a detective sergeant there. Um, a, she'd been there far too long, this woman. She must have been there 20 years. Not a healthy thing to do. And I said, I is there a problem? Knowing full well of this underbelly of child prostitution in London. Yeah. I said, is there a problem on this borough of Haringey with kids being involved in prostitution in the children's home? She went, no, 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 not problem. So there was a girl and part, part of your investigative job, you'll get given a side job as well. So one might be to look into reports of female genital mutilation because there was a lot of Congolese and uh, East Africans living on that borough and it, it was a reality. So someone was looking at that. There was another one that was looking at trafficking of kids so that, you know, um, but there was this post. The woman that did it, she, she'd now gone on maternity leave, which is a, another common factor with these um, child abuse units. They, 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 Like I said earlier, there's a lot of... Um, lactating mums end up with these jobs and they like to get home and it's it's just how it is but it, it, it's counterproductive and I'll explain exactly yeah. why that, that occurs I'm not digging anyone out but again I'm not here to placate yeah. wrongdoers you know and if they get caught up in the crossfire tough you know so um, they said no she, she's she been looking at it for two years not one case not one case mm -hmm. right and she said oh it's quite a good job because you'll go to, to some meetings yeah, all over the place yeah and you can F off home early, yeah. right? So I was like, oh, okay. So to them, it's a jolly. They call it a jolly, yeah. yeah. So I then ring up social services. So I said, have we got the, the phone number for social services? So she said, yeah, yeah. So I ring up social services and then they, and I ring them up and I say to the, can you fax me through um, a list of all your children's homes? I went, yeah, we've got a lot. There's 26. So all of a sudden this list comes through. Oh, sold that. Um, so this list comes through. This is part of uh, a document that ended up in um, evidence in, in the government inquiry. Uh, and this document comes through. And if you keep can that see, paperwork on yeah, there, yeah, 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 I'll keep it over here. And as you can see that here, there's 10 kids' homes, but and there's a few more on there, but um, there's a few more on the back, yeah. yeah but it went to 26 anyway. So we got them written down. Now, here I have my original book, my children's homes book which I bought myself so the Met Police can stick it because it's not one of theirs <laughs> because they... Oh, you'd have to hand it back. No, no. well, one of the things they, they, they arrested me for was theft of paper because I used their printer to allegedly, allegedly, print out an invoice for my tree surgery business. Trying to get you on anything. So, so theft of a, a sheet of A4 paper. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> and, and I mean, I, you're getting I, desperate when you get to that yeah, level. You know, yeah. And I said, I, no, I, I said to them, I said, well, I'll see you in court. I think yeah, I think yeah. a jury yeah. would favour yeah. my my rationale over yours. Yeah. So uh, if you think you're going to get away with that and they can't see that it's bullying, yeah. good luck with that one. And of course, the CPS just threw it straight out the window. Yeah. So I get this list of kids' homes, and here's here's my book. So this is basically uh, real time. So I open my book, and, and on my book, I mean, if I just show you there, you can't yeah. see on the camera, there's names, and there's the kids' homes' names. <clears throat> and they correspond, this kid's home that with, with names on, on this list. So I ring up, I get through to the first one, which is in uh, Hornsey, I think, and... Uh, and I speak to the guy's names here and I said, you know, this is what I'm doing. Have you got any problems with, with, with missing kids? Because they're missing kids, right? But they go missing for a reason. They go missing because they're being trafficked in the prostitution, right? Uh, how's, how's missing defined there? I mean, is it, is it just kids who aren't there often or, or just disappeared? Yeah, out, yeah. Out well, well system? See, see, this is it. So we, we, we get... Uh, a lot of conspiracy theorists will go on and say, the United Kingdom has 260,000 missing children every year. Well, that's absolute nonsense because within five years, there'll be no children. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's a load of, so missing is defined as a reasonable time if they're meant to be presented back at their home and they don't. Okay. And these are what they call regular missing people. So they're called reg mispers, regular missing persons. So they go missing every week. So there is no effort put in to investigating them. Now, the, the Metropolitan Police, as other police forces, will have a missing persons unit. The missing persons unit for Haringey was based at Hornsey Police Station, and I did link in with them. So the kids that I was told about that went missing, usually there's a pattern, always look for a pattern. 
There's a pattern in everything. Always look for a pattern. And that's the key to good investigation. You, you will always see a pattern. Usually on a Thursday, and they'll present themselves back on a Monday or a Tuesday. There'll usually be a call to the children's home uh, by the staff because the kids are kicking off. Why are they kicking off? They're kicking off because they're coming down from crack cocaine and or heroin. After the weekend. Yeah. And and they will be presenting signs of, of, of sex working. So there'll be a lot of bleeding from the vagina and the anus yeah. and things like that, you know. Um, and these are young kids that are meant to be in a place of safety, yeah. a place of care, <laughs> right? So so this, this guy, he says, look, yeah, yeah look. and he gave me the name of a girl. So look, we have five kids and we usually lose three, right? So he's given me the name of this girl. This girl's named here. And on it is her name. She's 15 years old. She's a regular missing person. So I'm on the phone now. She's picked up. By a red Fiat Punto, index, number plate, blah de blah de blah The person who picks her up is a black guy called Stephen, a.k.a. street name of so-and-so, yeah. right? So all of a sudden, for two years they've had nothing. In, in Literally in this period of time, this guy has given me a name of a girl who's involved in street in, in prostitution, but this, this was in a, a, a sauna. Um, over, I think, by Green Lanes, that area there. It's given me the car details and the man who's doing it. So everyone who has sex with that girl, that's statutory rape because yeah. you can't consent. This bloke then is procuring her, which we're talking double-figure sentences here. Yeah. Right? How comes I got that in five minutes? And this this lazy whatever, yeah. she couldn't in two years. So... And the fact that the guy had taken those notes, but known not there's no point giving it to anyone. Yeah, he's doing, yeah, like, like exactly. Yeah, just yeah. and and because he's obviously seeing that there's a problem here. And he's obviously seeing that there. This, but this no is wrong. Like, this anyone. is crazy. You know, yeah. like what's going on here? This is really suspicious. It's dodgy. And then he seems to be compiling information. Yeah. And then where's it go? But yeah. it, it gets even better. So when when this girl, she goes missing, he would then have to fill out a form seventy four, which would then get faxed fax machine to Harringay Social Services and it would land on their desk and it would also land on the desk of the missing person unit at Hornsey Police Station which was on the same road as this kid's home <laughs> right so they've all been told yeah but what's been done nothing nothing, nothing. Yeah. so then I pick up the phone again and I ring up the next one they've got two girls aged 13 and 16 that go missing the next one they've got a boy and two girls one of them had had six children, and out of the six, five of them were being picked up. Five of them. So over the weekend, there was just one yeah. kid sat yeah. there. And, and and one of these boys. Let me let me talk about the sheer extent of this. This lad, he, as to my knowledge, he died. He was still being trafficked out, being picked up, and he was being taken to the Kent area. Right, he's sixteen years old, and he was in the latter stages. Of AIDS, not HIV, AIDS. Yeah, yeah, so he done. had sores in, in yeah, his colon yeah, and yeah. everything. He was in care. They knew about him and he was dying on his feet. And what was done? Nothing. Right? So so this is within, by the end of that day, not too short a time period as we've been spoken, I'd found 10 children. Right? By the end of three days, I'd found 50 50. 50. In Haringey. Haringey. One bar. So, so I hold a meeting. And luckily, I had back then a really lovely detective inspector. He was a good man. And there are some good ones, right? I was going to say, I, was hope, I hope there are some good ones. <laughs> there's a lot that aren't. Right. But there's The system a lot. doesn't allow for certain... And, and they don't allow it. They're sycophants and they're cowards. And I'm calling them out. Yeah. And they are. Because they've got no bottle. So you what, know? you took this information to him? Uh, yeah. And I said, look, look, Governor. Um, he went... I want to hold a meeting. So all those that proclaim to to support kids, all yeah. these charities, all these NGOs, non-government organisations that are getting good money, and the charities, some of them are getting assisted money from the government, big charities, there's one, again, over there, that bit bulk of paper, I'm not going to pick it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. That name's probably the leading children's charity in that. Yeah. And I'll call them out, and they got called out in the... Um, in the government inquiry and the woman who was head of for that charity for child trafficking and child safeguarding right 
I've called her out as well because I held a meeting. So I called this this charity that's meant to help the children that are on the streets involved in this. I called out um, these other charities that help kids get into education. I, I, everyone was invited. Everyone sat at my table, right? And I called the social services point of contact for not just that borough, but for this borough here, Camden, for the borough of, of um, uh, Hackney, for the for the West End, Westminster, and I, and, I, and I invited my old unit, who was meant to be dealing with child prostitution, right. the vice unit. They were invited. All turned to the meeting. And did the meeting that, happen? Yeah. They never turned up the vice unit, said it weren't their problem. <laughs> At what point is it not their problem? Yeah. And again, the government inquiry addressed them for that one. Um, there was um, a mother as well. No, oh, that's another meeting. I'll deal with that in a sec, right? So I opened the meeting and I said, right, this is this is what we're here for. And straight away, the, the head of Ch Safeguarding for Harringay Borough, she stands up and she says, what the effing hell have you done, John? And I'm like, what? Why do you punish people for doing good, you know? They're done doing bad. Their, doing their job. Yeah. You know, if a dog's been good, you don't go and kick it in the knackers, do you? You know? And I'm thinking, what? And I said, but you know about these kids. She said, oh, I've now got to put a protection plan in for every single one. While they were doing what they're doing, they didn't come to notice. But well, they yeah, wouldn't oh. because these kids are now got what they think is a boyfriend, but it's AKA a pimp. Yeah. Right. It's still a sense of well being. If we, we understand how people live, the Maslow hierarchical plan, if you look at this Maslow thing, it's very interesting because the Maslow scale is also. Hierarchy of needs. But it's also how you identify psychopaths. When you interview, because uh, a psychopath, higher up, it's always their needs. They've all got base level needs. So a psychopath is about them. So psychopaths do crazy things. When you ask them questions about serious crime, they'll minimalize the extent of the horrors. Whereas if, if you saw someone shot, right, you would tell your mates down the pub and you'd go, my God, there was blood everywhere. Well, it wasn't. A paramedic would say, you know, there was a half a pint of blood and it would be normal to them, right? They would deal with it. They would be composed and they'd deal with it. But for you, it would be trauma and all that. Uh, a psychopath would just say, oh, there's a little bit of blood. And how many times have you had these ex-gangsters oh, give him a bit of a slap, that's right, all. Yeah, yeah. And the blokes had his limbs cut off, yeah. right? But then they would do silly things like, I, I do remember that day because I was really hungry and I went and I had a Chinese. Well, why mention food yeah. because that's the maslow food is a base level so they will mention right. base level things in the interviewing and that's how you can identify psychopathy okay. right. and it's it's quite straightforward but it's very commonsensical when so, so anyway we'll go back we'll go back to this so this woman is screaming now because she's now got to put in 52 care plans which means she's got to do some work yeah that basically comes down to that she yeah. just wants has to do work I, 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 her I'm, job. Sure, I'm sure that's that happened i mean it happens a lot in every yeah, yeah. That i've worked yeah. and it's, it's just a job to them yeah it, well yeah because it just means more work yeah. you, you're you're creating more work for management as well <laughs> and that's always an issue when whenever you're like you're like oh manager could you uh, this right yeah Here's here's the stuff that I've, I've been told to do. Um, you need to do a bit of stuff to this. It's always which, which I get, I get if you're dealing with a product. But when you're dealing with people and you're dealing with vulnerable young people who are being exposed to a world in which they are facing life-threatening situations such as cocaine and heroin addiction, they've got no protectorate to look after them they're, they're in a very dangerous industry the sex industry so so the, the risk factors are through the roof right and they have been through the roof for a long time it, so, indeed it's not it's not washing machines i mean this is people's lives kids yeah, lives, yeah, you yeah. Know I mean? and and you know they're involved in prostitution and a lot of them were supporting life-threatening conditions such as contagious tuberculosis, something that they thought they'd eradicated is a massive problem. Mm. I don't know why we're worried about the, the flu virus. Tuberculosis is unbelievable, and it's contagious hepatitis C, which, which, which can cause AIDS-type suffering, and it's airborne as well so what, what did yeah. you, when you said this to her like when she said that what did you say well I, I just sat there I, I couldn't believe it and then the next thing I had was this point of contact for this big charity that supports children 
She turned around, she said, you're stepping on toes. And I went, I beg your pardon. She said, you think you're reinventing the wheel. And I thought, I couldn't, I just couldn't believe what was happening. It's like I've just saved a child from being run over by a train and all of a sudden I'm being done for trespassing on the railway line, you know? <laughs> I'm like, well, what, what? Yeah. And she said, um, we've been looking into this for a long time. And, um, and she said, I'm going to report you to Superintendent so-and-so at um, Scotland Yard. Um, and I thought, well, who the hell is he anyway? But again, Going back to what had just happened, I got sold. If I ever look into again, I'm going to lose my home, my job, my children. I'm now triggered, you know? I'm like, well, this is, what what is going on? Yeah. What, in in the name of all that is decent and good is going on, if only I had a camera there and I could have played this to the world. I'll yeah, tell you what, yeah. the Met Police wouldn't have any funding now. Yeah. I'm telling you now. And and I'm like, and, and bear in mind, the last case I dealt with, a little girl died, you know, well, two died on that, on that case. Um, so I went, I went to see this. She said, we've got an officer that's been looking at it. And the bizarre twist, a uh, quirk in this is that this officer, she said, was looking at all of London, one officer, all these children for all of London. She ended up on one of my interview courses a couple of years later when I was running my specialist interview courses. And I said to her, go away with her. She went, yeah. I said, do you know so-and-so from this charity? She went, yeah, yeah. I said, she said that you're the one who's um, uh, looking at all the child trafficking. She went, yeah, but I I've been to a couple of meetings. I said, well, what children have you had involvement with? She went, none. She said, how many children are involved? She didn't have a clue. <laughs> she did not have a clue. So it was all a lie. Yeah. And then, of course, I had to then go and see this superintendent. And he said, you know, you need to back away. You know, usual nonsense. These idiots come out with, they pump their chest out. So it was shut down. So it shut down. And, and lo and behold, um, I moved on. I'm, I'm ghosted away. I mean, that also combines with the, the backlash of the baby P yeah. case as well. But considering... What these, these units deal with, you know, the, the, the high impact, the gravity of criminality they're dealing with, they didn't give a toss. It, it, it wasn't even on their radar. Now, because of all the government inquiries that have had to go on, I mean, this is a big deal, especially the one that, it, that, that just took part last year. They've all been slated for a massive monumental failing. And my evidence was that none of these departments talk to each other because they don't have to. I even drew a Venn diagram which formed a big part of the evidence of, of a kid in the middle with all these units that should deal. But the police culture is, if you can row out, you row out. Someone else can deal with that. And you say, well, who's going to pick that little kid up? Well, that's no, their problem. It's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not on their side of the road, not yeah, mine, you know? It's not, yeah. And that's their mentality. You know, it was absolutely appalling. And of course, it it, it, it crashes and burns, you know? And of course, it's going to. Um, but what yeah. they, I'd say it's awful that even in jobs, like even in really important jobs, you know what I mean? And like, I, I've seen this Lives, a bit in the healthcare system as well. Lives. Same thing. They're like, well, it's not really my department. It's not really my yeah. thing. You know, uh, maybe when they just bounce people around to different, well, to different departments, different people, you know, uh, I mean, there, there, there's a, a lovely saying by a guy called Edmund Burke, who, who was an Irish politician and everything else. And he said, in order for the triumph of evil. It takes but for good people to do nothing. And that's so true. You know, it's not my job, but I made it my job. So so all of a sudden I've got this again and and I moved on. What did you move on to? Right then, right, so I had, um, a guy had, had, had uh, a case, a guy in his office had a case. Now it showed out, if you saw my desk, honestly, it was like a mountain of paperwork, right? It was just files and, and everything. And in, in amongst there, there was a phone and a bit of space for me, right? My head would come up every now and then. And there was, there was about eight of us in this office. And there was two of us were like that. I worked with a, an Irish guy and he was brilliant, you know, and we were smashing it. We were really going for it. There was another guy there. His desk was totally clear. He had a fish tank on his desk, <laughs> you know, and all he would do is go out shopping for trainers. This bloke was an <laughs> out and out moron. He, he had this case given to him and it landed on his desk. He said, uh, this little kid, we, there's the neglect in the home. And it had been outstanding for something like 
18 months. A girl had it before, had done nothing with it. She then went sick. I think she went on maternity leave or something like that. Given to him. He did nothing with it. And it was the mother was alleged to have been abusing this kid and subjecting it to harm. Um, so I come in one day and my boss said, look, um, you, you're going to have to go and do a rebail for, for this other officer. I went, okay, well, there's a paperwork there because you need authority. It needs to be signed off by an inspector. Went, yeah, it's all there. And he said, just give him a call. And again, you'll see the same people going sick. I never went sick one day in 19 years. Really? Not a day in 19 years. Towards the end, I really smashed it yeah. from the sickness. But I, I'd lost my heart by that time. But before that, I, you know, and I had four kids at home. You know, I was dedicated to what I was doing. And so I ring this idiot up at home and he, and he said, oh, look, um, just um, rebail her, get rid of her, uh, do do a quick interview, but just one to rebail her. So this, uh, literally a five minute interview and get rid of her, bail her out. So we go along to um, Hornsey police station and this woman comes in with her solicitor. Um, the job is initially given to my mate, this Irish guy, and he's sticking to, he's sticking to the, um, to, to the plan, you know? He's like, you know, none of your big, because I, I love my interviews. I would, I really got into it because I'd started working with profilers when I was on Vice and I, I, I really got into the, the psychology yeah. of, of, of sex offenders. And, and for me, it, 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 it was more than a sport. It was um, a way of, of, of getting in and destroying them. And what he's telling you, none of that, just get on with it. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, none of this, John, we, we want out, you know, breakfast, let's yeah. go. Uh, and anyway, so so as as um <laughs> he's doing this interview, uh literally just careful to, with that piece, but I'm worried. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just to sort of like dot a few bits and pieces. Um, I, I've got this file, and it's a paediatric report, and I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this, this, the injuries are are appalling, and they go on for a long time, you know. And the paediatrician, one of the paediatrician, I knew this woman. Right, because she dealt with when I was working elsewhere. She dealt with a lot of the the sexual um, medical examinations of kids. She's a good woman, you know. She'd been doing it a long time. She had a heart for it, and uh, and she's put in a couple of these injuries. Uh, it wasn't just her, but there was other doctors. But she's put on it. This is a high impact blunt trauma related, um, uh, you know, incident, um, and it was akin to someone full force smashing this kid in the face. You know, and it, it, this kid had had huge bruising here, but his body was just appalling. And this, this fella had this on his desk for months and wanted to rebel this woman. And I'm reading it, I'm thinking, no, man, this ain't happening. Mm. So my mate went, uh, as you do, as customary, your lead interview leads it, and at the end of it, uh, uh, as, you know, second, uh, you, you're you're allowed to ask a question if if you want, but the lead interviewer leads it. So I said, yeah, if I may, I've got a couple of questions. And so I said uh, to this one, you know, um, can, can you just tell me a bit about some of these injuries? And she went, yeah, yeah well, my son bruises really, really easy. I went, oh, okay. I said, can you give me an example of, you know, of how? I said, there, there's an injury here. Now, what you've got to do when you interview is that there's a there's a halfway mark. You let them have their side, right? You see a lot of these police things on the telly, I put it to you, and it's very challenging, yeah. very adversarial. Well, that's stupid, right? Where are you going to get? Someone always say it's a wise man that plays a fool, you know? And my trade craft was I always come across as stupid. I was always scruffy. I was never on time. But I knew my case and I knew it inside out, you know, and I didn't care what people thought, you know, they'd say, oh, I just, you know, yeah. nuts. But, um, um, but I end up with a very good reputation, you know, and there's something, this is why the Turkish mafia wanted me out of the way because they used to say, he, um, they called me the blue eyed Turk. They had a picture of me and they used to say, he looks like us, skin color, but his eyes are blue. And he said, He's, he makes out he's stupid. He said, but don't trust him. He's a snake. He's a snake. So, you know. uh, uh, so I said, well, please explain your booze. He said, well, 
I said, there's an injury to the face. Well, this is a one. Well, who is it? Is this the, f uh, the dad or something? Well, well or the mum. Like, this is a oh, mum, right? You see, and, and, you know, and again, this goes on about women abusing yeah. children, you know, and when when you profile it, when a woman abuses a child, it's done with, with a, 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 a veracity and viciousness a man can't muster. Right, really? Yeah, especially sexual abuse. And when, when, when someone is sexually abused, a boy is sexually abused by a woman, they're six times more likely to sexually abuse themselves than, really? than if it's the other way around. It has a very damaging effect. Yeah. And w when they they are interviewing um, serial killers, for example, one of the first things they need to establish is is their relationship with the mother. And and this woman, she's the mother of the kid. She's a mother, okay. right? So, and, and she's a liar, you know? And... So she said, like, I said, well, there's this injury. So I've, I've read the, the, the professional's opinion. This is a full right-hander yeah, yeah. to the face. And so I said, she went, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I said, okay, so I pen and paper again, draw out my little body map and put the little face. Let's see this. Can you explain this? Yeah, she said, he was hitting the face. I said, well, we're getting somewhere. Hmm. Again, what does that mean? What does this mean? Tell me. Tell me about that. What do we know? There's a hit in the face. What don't we know? Who did it? How was it done? You know, with what? You know? So anyway, she goes and said, a hit in the face by his friend. Well, who was his friend? Was was it was it Frank Bruno? She I mean, pounding the lie now. Now you've what, got what, someone else involved. Well, no, but what you're doing is, is is you're making a take ownership and you're exploring it, right? So Yes, yeah, she's companion alarm, but she's got to take ownership of that lie. Don't let her now have ambiguity to worm out. So she said, yeah, he's a friend. So who's a friend? Same age. So another two-year-old kid, for example, has hit me in the face, right? Well, what? Show, talk to me. Show me this hit. Oh, it was like, and she stands up. She goes, really slow. So it's under-exaggerating it. Yeah. Hit him there. How, with what? what? What went on, you know? Oh, it was with one of them teething rings. So you've got these foam teething rings. So I'll get her to then draw it out, what it looked like, its consistency. Well, a foam teething ring, it's got it's got the consistency of like a bit of jelly. It's what the kids put in their mouth when yeah. they're, you know. Yeah. So it's soft. It's soft as anything. So then... It's supposed to go in a kid's mouth. So yeah, I'm yeah. guessing so, it's supposed to be quite so, soft. So what yeah. I'm doing now, she's got to take ownership. So I'm not going to leave it at that. So we revisit it. So let's go through this. In her words... But I do her words. You're saying that his friend hit him in the mouth, causing that injury. That so he can't say no. That occurred right, later. Yeah. That yeah, that injury because he bruises easy. We've been told uh, very slow. So I, I then recreate it and I'm explaining it and verbalising it because this is going to be transcribed before the dates of video interviewing and with with a teething ring with the consistency of a wet sponge has hit your son in the mouth and caused that bruising. Yeah. I said, well, he really does bruise easy, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Got her, Right. Well, what about the injury? I won't label this too long because it could go on forever, yeah. but this, this injury to the hip. Oh, he fell off the chair. We need to know how high the chair was. What was the floor like? Oh, yeah. Is it concrete? What was it laminate? Was it, Underlay thing, boom, boom. So you're almost pointing out the stupidity along the way but, and documenting but, yeah. it. But what I'm doing, I'm closing <laughs> doors. Remember what the caution says. You do not have to say anything, but it may arm your defence if you do not mention something which you re later rely on in court. I'm going to shut that door to stop her relying on court on a load of nonsense she's going to come out with. Yeah. She can't backtrack and say, no, I meant this, because we covered it. Yeah. We properly covered the ambiguity. That's gone. So... We went through this falling, and it turned out that there was um, a bean bag. The, the 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 chair was like so high, sort of indicating, you know, like like um, hip height. Fell off that onto a bean bag, a big bean bag, and then rolled on the floor again, compounding the line. Yeah. And then that's how he got the bruise. I'm so you're at least you're consistent, aren't you? Yeah. And what about you? We want to know about her. Oh, I'm calm, but she said something. She said I go to anger management. I pass them all. Well, why is she on the yeah. management? Anyway, so that's okay. So we've sealed that. She's had her say. We've clarified it to the nth degree. We couldn't have done any better. Well, I couldn't have done any better. Sign, seal, boom. She's got ownership. So now I now bring in professional's evidence. Right? She likes me. We're smiling. We've got rapport. We've got eye contact. 
I'm now going to kick her straight between the legs. And my intention now is for her to hate me because yeah. I'm going to burn every bridge I've just built. Yeah. Right. If I'd have done that, like on these TV things, I put it to you. Yeah, yeah, it's not what am I going to get out yeah, of that, yeah. you know? So now I say, right, this is a, a pediatrician who is experienced in many, many years. And, and here's a qualification. Read it out. You smash. You re really do that. And she's saying, this is a high impact trauma injury, like a blunt instrument. Boom. That's that. This one is this. Boom, 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 boom. And now you see, she's, I've, I've done her. Yeah. I've absolutely done this psychopath, right? She stood up. She said, you, see you next Tuesday. Spat in my face. So I said, so that is the monster your son sees, isn't yeah. it? And it went all off, right? Yeah. Well, because that was a baby peas, mum. You know, oh, right, okay. you know, and that was it. Boom. And because when when they have the, the what they call a part eight review, which is a government team comes in when there's a major failing, I was the only officer, and again, I'm patting myself big on the back here, the only officer that had any dealings with that that case that came out of that with a, with a, a, a commitment. Right? The baby P thing. Yeah. It rings more of a bell now we're talking yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Just, just it has been in recently yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And so as a result, what happened then, I got approached then by a senior officer um, and said, look, listen to your interview. We all had to listen to, you know, when the review team come in, why don't you do this as a career? I went, what do you mean? He said, look, there's a position with a specialist unit at Scotland Yard and they teach interview skills to detectives and to specialist units. Look, I'm going to recommend you. It's a really good number. So from, from there, I then move on. I, I end up being moved to to the London Borough of Brent, Holston, and that working with, with the child protection. But from the, and, and that was just crazy. That was just a mad time. They, they were good people. And a quick thing about them, there was two teams, and we worked out of um, a, an old disused police station in, in northwest London. And it was hard. It was pr That's the hardest I've ever worked in my life. And these, you know, they were... They were just flat out. There was no time for backstabbing or anything. The moment you went in, that was it. It was real nose to the grindstone, real ghetto policing with, with the um, child abuse stuff. But everyone was badly, badly traumatized and damaged. Um, so I go into the other office, office, which is opposite ours, and I go in there, and there, there's a woman, she's slumped on the desk crying, nine in the morning. It stinks of stale alcohol. There's a guy there just sitting there staring at the no one. He's still drunk from the night before. Um, and there's another bloke with just his head in his hand. And he was actually, uh, had lost his driving license through drink driving and managed to get his job back. Um, they were all alcoholics, you know, functioning. One was a registered alcoholic, they were functioning. Um, and one woman, she looked at me, she said, I have not slept in my bed for two years. I just wake up on the floor buy a bottle of wine every night or many bottles of wine they were all on meltdown it, because it was so hard mm. so that's why i can't attack them all because there's good ones mm. you know that really give it their heart so what they decided to do one day is usually uh the police is a real drinky culture and that's when they've got the time to do it, you know. And a lot of these Scotland Yard units, they have got the time and, and the resources, like the anti-terrorist units and all that. And I end up working on, on one of these things and they get loads of money chucked at um, big sexy jobs. But do they? What, what difference would it make? It make no difference to society. Society would not be better off for some of these units. Uh, but this, th these poor sods and child abuse, they're, they're overworked. They're, they're small budget. We have one car between us. Um, you know, I, I looked at a, a bloke for um, rape and attempted murder and ended up taking him on a bus. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and I had to stop and get his oyster card topped up Jesus. and then put him on Damn another him. bus. You know, it, it was just mad, but we went for a drink. So that one of the sergeants said, look, let's have a team drink. We, we deserve it. So we managed to get a, the neighbouring police unit for, for the child to, to cover us for that. So we shut down the office that afternoon Let's go and have a drink. So, brilliant. Meet in this pub, this bar, you know, up in Stanmore in North London. Um, five o'clock, let's have a pint. It's oh, so brilliant. So, anyway, we all sort of make our way up there. The detective sergeant's already there, and he's bought everyone a pint. So, I'll get my pint. This woman comes in, and she's the one that slumped on the desk. She looks at him, she says, oh, I want a red wine. He went, all right. She gets the red wine, 
drinks it, and then she just chucks it over, the rest of it over him, and, and whacks him with the glass, smashes it over his head, and that was our drink up finished. It was gone. But what did she? What was she? It, it, it was too much trauma. Oh, wow. too much. Too. It was too little, too late. Yeah. You know, it was. It gone beyond the point of niceties. These were people that were so broken and traumatized. You know that the next step would just be heart attack and yeah, die. Yeah, yeah. You know, because it was it was so horrific. Um. Is, uh, is there not sort of support or is that frowned upon it, or, it, it, to ask for help? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To ask for help is, is, is a massive sign of weakness. Uh, yeah. Um, back then anyway. And if you ask for help, you're taken out. Well, your mate's going to have to do the job. They ain't getting anyone else in. Yeah. So you're just putting it on your mate, you know? So all they'll do is you, you're over. Oh, that's okay. We had all had to see a psychiatrist twice a year. But the psychiatrist's job was to keep you in that post, not kick you out of it. Just to make sure you're all right so to carry well, on. You know, a tick box. So what they'd say is, oh, you know, um, you had a well. shave. Yeah. Uh, well, no, but I had one last week. Well, so you are regularly shaving. Well, yeah. Oh, oh do, do, do you wash? You had a shave. Well, I didn't have one this morning, but I had one. Oh, so you are regularly yeah. washing, you know. You keep oh, you on so, top of it. Yeah. yeah, so personal hygiene and self-care is there. That's it. <laughs> do, do you feel like committing suicide? Well, if you put anything down like that, you're not going to get a promotion. Right, yeah. You're not going to get another job. So if you want to move on and you put down that you've got suicidal tendencies, when you move on to a yeah. job, they'll see it on it. You ain't getting no job, so no one says anything. And and the, and it's one of those things, I suppose, if you say, oh, I can't cope with the work yeah. level, then, then yeah, that's going to... Just damage yourself. They might, get, try, they might think about getting rid of you. They yeah. might think about damaging damage your career, possibly. Well, you know? well, what they'll do is they'll just say, well, we'll manage that. So they'll reduce it for a week. And then you're back in, and then they'll say, "Look, I'm I, I meant to be on restrict hours. Yeah, but we got no one else. Go to this job. Yeah, and that's it. Just and it's a discipline service back then, so just get on with it. But then, so I then move on to this um, th th this job interviewing, and it was um, it was incredible. You know, it was it was phenomenal. You know, phenomenal. Um, and I, I was basically getting detectives and teaching them the fine art of interview skills. Uh, and how long were you doing that for? I did that for two years, which helped me with getting home for the children and everything else. Um, but again, so had, all this going on, you had four kids indoors. Four kids, yeah, 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 yeah. And one of my kids uh, at one point went blind temporarily. Yeah, because he had uh, such a pronounced squint, he was getting double vision, oh. and he had like two percent. And so he was he was undergoing major eye surgery, and they were taking his eyes out and relocating oh, them and and, uh, and it would cause blindness yeah. and all sorts so yeah it, and i never asked for help i never ever um put my hand up for help but and uh, through all this uh, what's your mental state are you were you sort of you it was bouncing off you a bit you were you able to hope was you struggling uh, all these years yeah so how do you sort of separate how that? did you feel it at yeah. the time yeah uh, alcohol oh really alcohol, so yeah and place. i didn't realize it uh, but i had this anger in me about what had happened now the the, the case for the um the one in the west end it, it that was it takes a long time right it takes about 18 months for things to go to court you know so this is now going to court um we had started off as, it, it some like 36 kids and they reduced it down to one kid right they dismissed some like 31 children that we'd take statements off and we'd interviewed and everything. It was down to one kid. And then that little girl died, was found dead. So it didn't solve anything. She died, no, didn't she? It, it was went down as a suspicious death. And her grandparents to this day campaign for justice because it was covered up. What she was there was some sort of um opiate that was injected into her, found dead. Uh but there was um the the woman that was doing the pimping out, she she got fifteen years in prison. So it made the national press. It was a first case of its kind under the new legislation. So th there was this anger in me that you know I started to realise what they'd done to me was wrong. Yeah, and it was disgusting, and it was immoral, and it was bullying at the very least. Um, but they'd, you know, they'd ruined me, my career and everything. It was. But there's so many times that you having to bounce off of something because you were doing the job and you had to bounce onto something. Oh, I'm doing my job there. Can't have that onto the next thing. Yeah. It, it was, it was just <laughs> constantly boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom and moving forward. And then, um, uh, so from there, uh, I got offered a couple of jobs because I was, I was, um, interviewing people and uh, sometimes I'd interview high ranking officers and, uh, 
one of them said, I'd like you to join this intelligence unit. And it was all top secret information that they were dealing with. I like you as a field intelligence officer. So I said, oh, okay. So I went for it. But the, the position I had to wait a couple of months and I was just desperate to get out of um, the, the education sort of side of it because it was the same thing each time. And it become very bitchy, you know, and you've got people that they, they had empires. We do it this way and I did it a different way, you know. And what used to upset them is they would have to go in with their manual and I'd memorized everything. And I was using real life cases and I, I taught a thing called timelining and I, I did it so well, it was all off by heart and it, it had it had good reviews. So at the end of the course, what would happen, there's something quite interesting I want to say actually, um, people would have to put in their, out of the 12 students, they'd have to all fill out a form and put in other words. And, and for years they'd never had a unanimous good review and I started getting unanimous good reviews. And what I, I always did, if someone did well, I would always write to the superintendent and said, you know, what a good, attentive student. Yeah. Whereas people always find the time, so I spat them, find the time to do something negative. They never found the time to do something positive. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They always want to condemn and not appraise. Yeah, and that is the negative criticism always gets passed around very easily. And it's, it's a shame that praise isn't often yeah. um, passed on the same. Yeah. I, I, I mean, can you imagine doing that to a pet dog? I keep using a pet dog analogy, keep attacking it instead of praising it. Well, you know, and I'm thinking these people must do the same thing to their own children. That's why people look down and they don't look up because they're always being browbeaten. And police have power and they bully and they do bully, you know. And these were, these were students that needed this course in order to get signed off as a de detective, right? So it was like a major stepping stone. Yeah. So they would start the course off with intimidation. And they'd sit around in a circle, and the instructor would sit in, in, uh, stand in the front and say to them, look, this is a two-week high-intense course. It's pass or fail. People do fail regularly. We kick people off. If you don't do this, then you'll be booted off. If this done up, boom, 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 boom. And you can see them. They're like rabbits trapped in the headlights. They're like that, you know? And, you know, we are the best. And it was all a load of old crap. And and then they, they would humiliate them. So I can remember sitting in as I was learning the ropes for the first couple of weeks. And it, everyone's nicely suited and they're all polite. And they, this student, this instructor went round, and there was a girl, a detective girl, and he went, you? And she went, yeah, what's your name? She says her name, you know, Nicola or whatever, I don't know. Stand up. Now tell the whole class about your first sexual experience. And she was like, you what? <laughs> you yeah. what? What's that? Well, <laughs> with you expect children to say it. Right. So why can't you? Well, I sat there and thought, what if she'd been made by a dad? yeah. yeah. You know, what if that was her first sex, which, which I knew was a reality, yeah. you know? And I looked at, and and everyone, it was appalling. And what they were doing, when they would get the feedback sheets, if they were really bad, they will throw them in the bin. So they would only get nine sheets back. <laughs> so, but I, anyway, I started running the courses on, on my own. And uh, the, the girl who, who worked in the admin, she was a good girl. She, you know, she liked me a lot. She used to say, John, you want to see your reviews? They're bang on. So the boss come down, he said, John, whatever you're doing, it works. Yeah. And what I used to say is, when they come in, I say, right, you don't have to, it's a communication course. If you don't participate, that's up to you. If I ask a question I ask to the class, shout out the answer. If you don't shout out, I'm going to give you the answer because I'm not here to learn off you. And I say to them, anyone got kids? And I go that. So if you need to go in for your kids, just let me know and go. If you're late, send me a text message because some were traveling from Kent and they had to get to Hendon, you know, miles away. Mm. So don't worry, don't panic. If you need to go home early, let me know. You can go, right? And I said, Friday, we go for a pint, right? And you could see them go like that. So it wasn't, the, 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 the idea wasn't sort of to test the metal. It was just pricks teaching. Oh, they were bullies. Right, which yeah, it, it wasn't like set to, we've got to make them tough. It no, was just no. like, which is what Arsenal. they do, yeah. and, and they would just deliberately confuse them. And, and and I thought, well, this is nonsense. It's easy. It's so straightforward, yeah. and it is an easy way of doing yeah, this. Yeah, and I said, yeah. look, there's no difference between interviewing a suspect and interviewing a person. An interview is a conversation with a purpose. Be nice. Never underestimate the 
the, the, the you know the power of being nice and how long were you teaching those courses for it's for two years but what i started doing was i would start then unofficially teaching them to recruit informants i said because your suspect is going to be your informant and they'd never done that before and it, it was really yeah. reaping rewards you know they was really doing well so it was going out there into the community of the police community that two courses were run in parallel if you've got one with john wedger you're going to have a good laugh. If you've got one with one of us, it's going to be horrible. So you'd hear it sometimes. They'd sit in the classroom and the the, the, the main instructor come around and write down on the board who the instructor is. And you, you could hear when my name went off, people going, yes. And the other one <laughs> going, mm -hmm. oh, no. but, but one day, um, this guy come up to me and uh, a black guy, black copper, and, and he, he come up to me, he said, um, can I have a word with you? Can I like buy you a rum. I went, all right. He said, I like buy you a rum, Jamaican boy. And I went, all right. And he bent down. He said, look at my head. And he got bald head. And there were scars, big, deep scars all down his head. He said, I want to apologize. I went, why? He said, I've been quiet. And I haven't, I haven't really contributed. He said, but you know, you talk about the kids' abuse. He said, I was abused. He said, my mum was a prostitute. I was put into care. And he said, one day my mum would beat me and she hid me in a room while a client come in, she was a heroin addict, and I had a cold and I was locked under the stairs and I started coughing and her client couldn't have sex with her because he was put off because my client. So they opened the door and my mum beat me with a, a frying pan causing that cut. They both overdosed and they collapsed. And then they, I don't know what happened, whether they died or whatever, but... He was there for six days in that cupboard. See, hell. Six days. So they nearly died. They put me in care. So for me to speak out is like a trauma yeah, yeah. thing. And he said, when I knew I was coming on this course, I'd heard the rumors about how intimidating it is. He said, John, I was wet in the bed for a month. Really? I was crying. I was that frightened. Yeah. He said, and when you stood up in the first bit, he said, I saw your name. I, I knew that it was going to be not so bad. And when you said you're not going to pick anyone out, he said, right, I, wanted, yeah. I wanted to cry and I wanted to hug you. Yeah. He said, you're, you, you, you're a good man. And it, it made me realize then, you know, the power of being a nice person. Yeah. And and even now, I was walking uh, down the roads and um, a police car pulled up and they went, Mate, I went, what? He went, John, innit? When he said, You taught me my interview course. Oh, right. I'll never forget you. And he, he come out and shook my hand, you know. So it does resonate. Yeah. You, you'll always remember those uh, people. But, but what happened then? Um, I got, I, I ended up recruiting an informant. I got a phone call from someone while I was doing this. So I've got information about uh, Crash for Cash, you know, when people drive into yeah. cars and smash. And it's run by different cultures different ethnic groups have different crimes that are synonymous with them these were run by afghanis they had this down to tea multi-million pound racket all afghanis and again geographically it was always certain roundabouts usually around the edgeware area because there's big afghani communities right and the guy who was coordinating apparently he lived like a king out in kabul and you know um anyway this it was a casino cheat come and said, look, I've got info. Are you interested in this cash for crash? So I was still running informants and I was still being dragged off to go and visit prisons and things like that, which used to upset the other instructors, you know, they, they, they got jealous of that. Anyway, they've been looking for this guy for years and all of a sudden it's given to me on a plate the the, the garages they use, the storage places, they're all in on it. They're all in on the scam, the insurance company, they're all in on it. The props who sets it up when they do it. And so I, I, I was doing a lesson. I said, does anyone know anything about this cash for crash stuff? And the student one said, yeah, I'm on this, this traffic investigation unit. There's CID in the traffic units now. Now I didn't like traffic cops. I thought they were strange and I still do. They're, they're weird people, you know, <laughs> and they're just. You say that another cop, a copper I know said this to me separately. She said, I, I don't, she said, I don't get on with the traffic. No, no, traffic no, they're, they're, they're I don't know why. I don't know. Just like, yeah, they're like on their own. Oh, they're thing. idiot. Yeah. I just, it's not my thing, you <laughs> right. know, and, uh, but, but they had a CID unit, right? And they had a unit that invests. So I hand over and this, and it was a high ranking officer on this. He said, 
John, do you, do you want to join us? We could do. We've set up. Well, there's a load of overtime. We'll try and get you somewhere, but you'll have to be working out of a traffic garage. So they call them garages. He said, well, get one in your house, but you're not one of one of the lids, one of the traffic. You'll, you'll be within our CID team. I was like, oh, I'm thinking about it. He said, look, we, we need one, and we, we investigate road deaths as well. We get some murders and everything. And I thought... Well, that, I've not. That, that'd be interesting. Biggest mistake of my career. The most gruesome thing I've ever done. Investigate road deaths. Yeah, really? when you said that, was the really? first thing I thought. Most you're gonna have to see appalling. Really? I mean, it's not uh, movies. Uh, uh, even worse than all the stuff. That yeah, you've yeah. Been doing. Oh man. Even really standing out. Yeah, all yeah, the, the yeah. horrible stuff. Yeah, that... yeah. This really took it to another level. I mean, wow. you could deal with three dead, proper mashed up bodies in a day. So, so when the body occurs, the death occurs. It's a crime scene, and, and as a detective, you're in charge of crime scenes. You have to search the. Um, and I'll tell you a really strange story that occurred with that. Um, so I said, "All right, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing that." So I, I went for the interview, and I got the job. So I thought, "Thank God, I can get out of this this education environment." It was, it was so bitchy. It was crushing me, you know. And I, but the the boss liked me because they they were getting lovely reviews, you know. Um, but we were, you know. I couldn't go, but I they wanted me to go on on a six month deployment to Trinidad. So these officers were going around the world teaching, but I had kids, so I turned down Trinidad. I turned down opportunity to teach in the Maldives, um, Abu Dhabi, all their police forces. Yeah, yeah, they were going all around the world. They were going to Jamaica. They were going everywhere. That's a lovely job. Yeah. But apparently Trinidad was it wasn't as glamorous. One guy went one day. He went for a walk to the market and he got he got oh, attacked Jesus with a knife Christ. and um yeah so it's not yeah. you know so uh, go on so the road traffic so so i end up um, um but my first day i'm going into this this traffic unit and they said uh don't go there go straight to scotland yard i went all right just just go straight there there'll be someone that'll explain it so i, I go to scotland yard and they said right um get in the car we're going to take in it and it was to a covert building that they had in central london right but while if it's just road traffic accidents what's the well well, well i didn't know what was going on you see right. and it turned out i've been seconded and they needed a unit because there was a lot of um during 2010 2011 2012 there was a lot of protests occurring yeah there was big public order and, and they had a problem the government had a problem because the students were it's a lot of uprising you know People at the were, time of the the riots as well. Yeah, the those, riots, yeah, those, all, all the same. That, that was time. A, yeah, very <laughs> bizarre. Time. No one talks about that, but that's yeah. like that was like a huge thing. They they like burnt down Croydon, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, Croydon yeah. got torched, yeah. and 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 it all occurred like that. Mm. It was weird. It had a weird vibe. You could feel it. I even I remember being in Reading like the day after, and there was like there was police everywhere, and they closed down several of the main roads. And this guy stood on a bus at shelter and said, "Come on, let's fucking riot." And these guys, these police, these police riot cops just came in and just bundled him down and just stuck him in the back of a van. And I was like, okay, I think I might go home, to be yeah, honest. It, and, and the students, a million of them blockaded Whitehall over their, their student loan thing. So the, the government, and, and so they, what they were doing was they had to drag people in. And I was part of this covert investigation team. And our job was to investigate and to infiltrate these, these groups. And it was an incredible thing to see how that side of policing works how much money they chuck into it we were they were throwing everything at us i i was given my own car um you know a higher car they gave me my car petrol car as much overtime you know it was it was bizarre working all over the place but when, when these especially the students i felt sorry for them because they were really stand up for their democratic right yeah and, and what they should have um really got a, a caution for they were getting 18 months prison for they really crushed them. They had 24-hour courts. They've never had it before. So magistrates were working 24 hours out of Horse Free Road. It was all put on. We had barristers working on our teams. So when you got a job in New it could take you maybe six months to a year to get it authorised. They were authorised in charge within minutes. And then it's the courts were prosecuted. Because you, you, everything you've said through the, the child prosecution and the torture, you got nothing. People start attacking the system and kicking up the stink. Yeah. How much money do you need? People start, people start making headlines. Yeah. 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 Open that's checkbook. Yeah, yeah. Here's your own car. Get and, out. And that's it. And and there was loads of us. 
you could go missing for a week and no one would know. Yeah. And maybe that did or didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it was, I could just couldn't believe it, you know, but it, it was wrong. It was wrong because yeah. they were prosecuting good people, yeah, yeah. you know, and they were, and I, I saw something really bad. And again, it started, I was never a conspiracy theorist, but my God, I, I did end up in my career caught in conspiracies. And there was a firm that would go out and give out cards in the riots, right? Call us if we get nicked. Oh yeah. And you think you know that you know they're, yeah. they're, what what are they doing? Are they they sort of trying to help? Uh, ambulance chasers or whatever. It, yeah. it was a con, right? And I tell you why it was a con. Shame on these firms, because I remember real this companies. Con- yeah, oh. yeah. There was there was a company um, that was in, in the Grazing Road. Again, I'm not going to say the name, but whoever they represented, I, I think you should um, go to the adjudicator and. Um, asked for a public inquiry into that firm and what happened is this this one kid had got caught up in the whole melee of it all right an inner city boy was a student at some college somewhere they'd all gone in unison and he'd done something it caught up in the moment it, and it was a minor criminal damage again if, if if you smash up a tower block look Grenfell still got the, all the, sh- the stuff around it Whitehall, the next day, they sandblasted, jet-washed it, and cleaned off everything the next day, you know? Anyway, so this lad goes before um, the magistrates. I think it was in Bow Street um, uh, at the time. or well, it might have been Hall Street Road, anyway. There was a, there was a magistrate there, and, and he's very well known um, throughout that, that circuit, the court circuit. And he's a fair guy. He is a fair guy, you know? Uh, he's fair to both sides. And he's looked at the paperwork for this kid and, and he's seen this kid's on low income and, and from poverty. And he said, son, I've seen the video. You've clearly done it. And of course, his, bar- his, solic- his solicitor stands up and goes, no, 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 that's subjudice. That's this, that, and the other. We, we, we're not having a trial here. And how can you surmise that he's clearly done it? Yeah. And the, you clearly see him chucking something through. It's on the video. Bus, dude, yeah, yeah. Bus shelf or something like that. He said, if you put your hands up now, you will be dealt with fairly and you will be walking out of this court. And I'm telling you, you'll be dealt with fairly. He is giving him the biggest lifeline he's ever given, right? And, and he's trying to help him, right? But he can't cross that legal boundary. And this vulture of a solicitor turns around and said, no, we are taking this for committal to Crown Court. Now, what they do, they play games, and this is how they hurt you. So if they want you, the system wants you, Say a drug dealer, right? Now, when it was dealing with the, the Turkish and the Kurdish mafia, we were we were talking, you know, tons sometimes, you know, big. With, with the street dealers, they were usually Jamaican of Jamaican origin, and they deal. They call it deal by mouth. They'd have little rocks in their mouth, and what can you keep in your mouth? Maybe a hundred quid's worth. Yeah. It ain't much, right? And what are they? Joey bags, a the tenner. They call them. Oh well, they call them Joey bags. A little. So he's got 100 quid's worth and he, he's just street dealing. It's nonsense. So that street dealer will, will go to court, go not guilty because um, he thinks his, his solicitor's getting away. So what they'll do, they'll send him, instead of sending him to an inner London Crown Court, of which there's many, where he'd be dealt with fairly, they send him to Kingston in Surrey, where it's white middle class. So he's now a black man street dealing in white middle class. He's getting eight years he would have got a year at, at yeah. the sub at Crown Court in a London or with Green. Go at Kingston, you're going away, right? Um, they Handling stolen goods, for instance, if you had a case of handling stolen goods, you would fight your hardest not to get it sent to Snaresbrook because Snaresbrook had an acquittal rate of handling stolen good HSG of 80 to 90% because they're all EastEnders and that's their game. <laughs> You know, I don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. And, and what they had to do, they had to stop taking the jury catchment area from in the East End, Essex, and they ended up their catchment area ended up in Ipswich <laughs> <laughs> because they were, they were letting everyone go. But I didn't know you could move things around like you can't pick and choose. Yeah, yeah they can yeah. do whatever they want. So what they were doing with these poor students, they were saying, right, right Kingston yeah. Crown Court. So this lad, young black lad, he now he could he was going to get a fine. Yeah, you know. <clears throat> he probably would have got caution, but they weren't allowing caution. He had to go to court. So he's now got Kingston Crown Court. 
and his barrister now. So he's gone from a solicitor now to a barrister. How much money is that costing? 450 quid an hour, which I, I mentioned earlier. Right. Money making machine. Like the care system, money making machine. And he's in there and they're going not guilty. I mean, he's done it. He's got the smoking yeah. gun in his hand, you know? He gets 18 months and he, he doesn't know what's happening. Yeah. He's like, and his mum thinks he's coming home. Yeah. She's crying and screaming. He's now banged up. Now he's in the system. 18, he's for 18 months. Yeah. She's now got to serve nine months of that. And what's he done? Minor, minor yeah. criminal damage. And who's won out of this? The solicitors. <laughs> you know? And that is it. And it, see, this is why, blame the police. Okay, there are times when they got to take the blame, but the system, yeah. once it gets out of them, the money. Yeah. You know, I weren't making 450 quid an hour, but they are. And how much is that? The trial, eight grand a day, eight grand a day at the public purse. And, yeah, and, and they're saying that they can't afford these, these youth clubs and all that because there's no money. <laughs> I'll get stuffed, yeah. you know, shove it, you know. So I, I, I ended up on, on, on this unit, um, and, and it, it was it was crazy and it was good. And I, I, I had a brilliant team. I was earning good money, but morally it was wrong. It was the first time I questioned my morals as a police officer. But I was earning money, you see. So, uh, you know, for the it first time. It's difficult, isn't it? I'm not yeah. in debt, yeah. you know. Mm. I'm out of debt for the first time. Um, but then, of course, that come to an end, you know. And then I've got to go to this traffic unit and I've got to deal with these... Um, you know these dead bodies and uh that weren't good you know that that really wasn't good the, the traffic officers themselves a lot of them were were, were traffic officers that were taking the detectives exams so they hadn't worked in the detective world like i had they'd, they'd come from what they call branch detective from their unit into there as so that so in effect they were still traffic officers and I was working with, with my team. It was a team of four or five. There was one nice guy, I must admit. All the others were all dual income, no kids. So they were either married to a copper or they were married to a professional. They were bringing in under grand between them, and I was still on the poverty line, you know? So I had nothing in common with them. I mean, it come to a thing. Well, I come in one day, and there was all them police bikes lined up, and one of the sergeants had a ruler, and he was measuring the aerials. I thought, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> what's this all about you know it's pedantic you mean uh, yeah bloody hell they were they were they, they weren't my people and yeah. i got to despise them uh you know and i just didn't like them i didn't like being around them and, <laughs> and they didn't have like that old detective yeah sort of air to it and all that but it was a dead bodies and um there there, there was one case there was a guy um had, had he was going to work bless him he had a young family a little daughter and a wife, they were all uh, migrants. He was from South America. His missus was from from Russia, Ukraine, something like that. And um, he was going into work, he was working as a handyman, uh, you know, a maintenance guy. And he, he hit a curb because there was a load of leaves. He couldn't see it, hit the curb. And he, he bounced off his bike and he fell on the floor, went to get up and a, a, a big bin lorry went over and squashed his head. Oh, Christ. And uh, and I get called, and Liz, of course, there's nothing of his head. And uh, true story, this, this is, so I, I sat there, and, uh, and I'm with him, and I'm just sort of searching his body, and I find his wallet, and there's a picture of his daughter, and him and his wife, and I said a prayer for him. I held him, and I said a prayer, right? And I said, please, you know, help this man go to the light. God help this man. You know, I believe in Jesus Christ and I put to the prayer. And the next thing, this hand is on my shoulder and it's a paramedic. And he went, can I join you? I went, yeah, please. So we, we said a prayer for him. And he said, I, I do it all the time, John. He said, I've never, ever seen anyone do it. He didn't know my name. Right, he said, yeah. I've never seen anyone do this. And I said, well, I do it quietly because they'd laugh at me, you know. And, he, and so we, we said a prayer for this guy. And that was it. Anyway, uh, a month or so went by and I get a message through. Can I contact this, the wife of this, this, this deceased guy? And uh, I think, oh, I don't know what, what's happening here. You know, so I ring her up. She said, can, can you come and see us, please? Can you come and see his family have come over from South America? And, you know, can you come and have dinner with us? I went, okay, I, I don't mind. So I went, 
I went out dinner and she said, um, what happened between you and my husband? I said, I don't understand what you mean. She said, something went on. I said, why? She said, because he keeps coming to me in my dreams and saying, say thank you to that policeman for what he did. Really? Please say thank you. Thank you. She said, what did you do? I said, I, I, I just said a prayer for him. And they all burst into tears. I said, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she said, it keeps coming in my dreams. She said, yeah. you must say thank you. Yeah. But I've become a family liaison officer. So that was a brilliant job, you know. So anyone that was killed or murdered died blinking with a family. What is the pro if you're somebody that you know is dead? So the phone call isn't going to be like, you've got to come to the hospital. Who, how does that get? Is there oh, well, an official the, way of dealing yeah, with yeah, it? Yeah, there is. And it's brutal. It's brutal. Really? You, you visit them. And the first thing you say. So no phone call. You just no, find no, your no, people, you, who they you are. find them. You turn up. There was one I had to do. And it was a, a guy who was a doctor. He was coming home um, and he was coming home to his in-law's house. No, it's his house. His in-laws were all coming around because they were planning his wedding. Oh, Christ. Right? And on the way home, he'd gone under a, a, a lorry or a bus or something and just killed, you yeah. know. And, but he was on his way back to house because they were planning the wedding. So they'd all got to a party. Oh. And, of course, we, we went now and... His mum answered, I said, are you Mrs. So-and-so? Is your son so-and-so? Yeah. And you've got to say, you said your son is dead. And so what that does, it hits them. Bang, right, like that, yeah. right? And then there's no point saying, oh, can we have a cup right, of tea? Can yeah, we sit yeah. down? Because they know something's coming. You're yeah, tormenting them. Yeah. And then at what point are you going to say, oh, oh, by the way, the tea's lovely, the cake's nice, uh, your son's dead. So you've got to hit them yeah. straight away. You must tell them, blunt and tell them. So it's like with a job. Have I got it? No. You right. haven't got that job. Yeah. Or yes, you've got it. And it gives them time to adjust. Yeah. And then you make the tea. Anyway, so look, your son's been killed. He's dead. Shit. And it's like, well, what happened? He was killed on his way home yeah. on a North Circular Road or whatever road it was. And I went, oh, oh please. Get. Anyway, so we went in. All the family's there. Oh, fucking hell. And so I had to tell the whole family. I said, I'm so sorry, but this is how it is. And you know? you're in your police uniform, then? No, you? I don't wear uniform. I'm a detective. Oh, oh okay, right, yeah. right. But there was a uniform copper cum. But it was just, it was, I was sent there as a family yeah. agent officer. Oh, okay, but right. it, I was with a young copper and he didn't want to do it. So I said, I'll do it. And all of a sudden we sat there. The next thing, the mother, it's obviously sunk in. She stood up and she's thrown a cup at me. She goes, get out of my effing house. It's gone. The trauma's got her. Get out. Screaming. Get out. It just went, went for me, you know? Um, and because I'm the, I'm the, the, the conveyor of bad news. Yeah. So then you have to withdraw, you can't have anything to do because whoever gives a bad news, it'll always associate you with bad yeah. news, you know? So, so that's, you know, that's how that went. And then there was, um, there was a, there, there was a case that, um, I mean, this, it, it weren't far off breaking me to be honest. And, um, it was terrible, terrible case. And it was a, a, a little girl, 11 year old girl and her and her mum we're getting on a bus, right? So I've got to try and explain this. So the bus stop, the bus is here. The bus stop is here. There's her, there's her mum, right? So they pulled up, the bus has pulled up. So they're getting on the bus like that. They're both yeah. getting on the bus. So the gap here, for some bizarre reason, is the perfect width of a family saloon car. So coming the other way, is a woman in a family saloon car for what we never know the reason. This woman accelerates. She loses control. She hits a curb. The steering wheel sends her down this way. She hits Onto a curb, curb that one. way. She's now really going a yeah. full speed and it shoots her straight down this corridor. We're not an inch either side right. gap. She hits the mother and the daughter fully captured on camera. The, the daughter goes nine meters in the air, 30 meters that way. So does a mother in midair, their legs intertwine and they land on the floor in, with legs yeah. tightly intertwined. The girl is killed by a, a sever to the spine, right? The mother suffers multiple injuries and is in a coma, life threatening injuries, right? She ain't getting out of this she's she's in yeah. trouble right i think she dies on the scene they get her back we get called down and their legs are intertwined right the the little girl 
ghosts for an autopsy. So they said, you know, this is this is your your family liaison for this one. Um, I can't get anyone to identify the body because the father is in prison for serious offences of violence, and some of them are against police. The mother's now in a coma; she's going to die. And this little girl is there. So we can't identify who she is. We know who she is because there's some ID on the bus thing. But we need it. So I have to get the school teacher down. And bless him, the school teacher comes and says, yeah, that's so-and-so. Yeah. And apparently she, she was a lovely girl, you know. But the mother, uh, again, I don't want to say things, to, but her life was involved in crime and, and the sex industry. Um, so this poor girl, she's not had a good start, yeah. really, you know. But she... For all intents and purposes, a very sweet, lovely girl. And at a funeral, all the bus drivers all turned up. It was it was quite moving. And um I uh I go to the, the autopsy the next day and I've got to be careful what I say here. Anyway, um I, I, I turn up and there's another officer who wants to come and, and the pathologist comes in, right? And I said to him, Look, and we've got it all on tape. And I said, we clearly know how the girl's died. I said, I'm now the exhibits officer as well. So my job now is to go in and, and watch the autopsy and take exhibits. I said, I don't want to see an 11 year old girl. Yes. Yeah. We know how she died. It's clear how she died. And he said, of course, I don't know why you look come in anyway. But the, the colleague that come with me insisted on going in. I thought, why would you want to see an 11 year old girl? And we're not talking about a normal post mortem. We're talking about a special post mortem, which means all organs, oh. even sex organs, everything cut open. They're, they're the most appalling thing. See, this is a copper's lot, you know? The most appalling thing. And I went, I'd, please, if I can be. And he said, I'll deal with the continuity, son. And bear in mind, the pathologist is a high, you know, the coroner's courts, they're the highest courts in the land. Right. And the pathologist holds a lot of weight. So if he says it's so, it's so, you know? Yeah. Anyway, this guy, he he was insistent on going in. And in the end, the pathologist told him to F off. Get out, get out yeah. my, um, you know, uh, whatever the room's called, you know? Just throws him out and he goes out screaming, you lot get an F off. And I thought, what a weirdo that yeah. he wanted to see. You know, and this is a colleague. Anyway, the pathologist comes out and he said, look, it was a sever. Uh, like he said, if I got a scalp and I cut the spinal column, I couldn't have cut it any finer. Right. He said, but there was not one bruise on that girl's body. And I've seen the video. She was catapulted eight meters up, 30 meters. Yeah. He said, not one bruise on her body. And do you know the ironic thing? It's exactly the same injury that my boy suffered. Exactly the same injury on the same vertebrae. That so my How did you not get any bruises? There was nothing. No bruises on her. No bruises on her body at all. So I think your child's body, maybe yeah. supple. It's just one of these bizarre things. Um, and it, it, it took ages and ages. Anyway, there's a lot of bizarre stuff went on in yeah. this case. Some very strange things occurred mm. with it. And I just thought this is it for me now I've had yeah. enough I've just had enough of this you know and what happened then was um I go to work and the TV's on and Jimmy Savile has been outed as a paedophile and I'm like what we all knew as a pedo right we yeah. all knew as a pedo I knew as a pedo I had things years yeah, ago yeah, about it and one of the things I I, I was at um a false intelligence bureau Right, so it's it's not just your standard intelligence unit the police use. This is a very higher tiered intelligence thing. And I can remember the, the intelligence officer. He said, "Look, put in this name, well known singer, right? Who claims he's innocent? Boom. There's offences there. There's uh, a woman actress seen as what do they call it? A national treasure. Mm. Offences for street prostitution." I'm like, you're joking. You know? <laughs> and and they're there, you yeah, know. Yeah. And and I, I even saw the Cray Twins um, uh, criminal history. And he was just saying, give me a name. We'll put it, you know. And, and this is when I started seeing these celebrity, you know. And, right. you know, I was like, oh, my word, you know. Um, so, you know, they know. They know. These yeah. names crop up. Yeah, yeah. There's a difference between proof and there's a difference between truth, you know. Yeah. And uh, they're worlds apart. We've got the highest burden of proof in the, in the world. 2% of, of sex abuse cases actually come to fruition, 2%. Does that mean 98% of these people lying? You know? 
it's, it must be very difficult to prove very. with that because, I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, I don't know, because it's sort of he said, he said, she said, and, and these things don't often get reported until much later. Mm. Just because of the way people, it's media, are, just, just, well, just the way people are and the way people process trauma and stuff. So, and then there's no often physical evidence because of, of it. Uh, and did, you could just say, well, it was consensual at the time. You know, when did the yew tree kick in? Was that because of yeah, someone yeah, before? Yeah, 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 no, that kicked in with there. Now, now, see, this is where things go to another level, right? And as a result of that, there's a police officer comes forward, and it all starts opening out, which is what happens with this. All of a sudden, people aren't alone. And of course, I've been threatened with silence. And there, there, was, there was a copper, a very senior officer called Lenny Harper. And he stands on TV and he's now giving this talk. And it's about a kid's home in Jersey called Haute de la Garenne. And the, the, the kids had made allegations for years that celebrities had visited. Jimmy Savile visited Haute de la Garenne and that they were used for sex parties on an island of Jersey. Again, where they're going to go? They were these were kids that were taken from placements on the mainland and taken to this island, and those that that got out of there, a lot of them went in, in the prison and drug addiction and everything else. Um, they were saying about sex parties in the basement where there would there was also rituals went on. Kids were handcuffed um, to the wall. They were put in a bath. They were they were cut sometimes. They were they were they died, you know. And there was quite a few kids come forward and said it. Um, and it was covered over. Anyway, an inquiry started. They couldn't, for some reason, stop the inquiry. And Jersey's very bizarre because it has a police force that is split. They got the police force of the Channel Islands and they got the honorary police force of, of, of Jersey, which are, Jersey comes under, um, what, what's 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 the it, term of it? It's a principality, isn't it? So uh, yeah, not, but there's, it is part of the UK because I do work f for the. Yeah, uh, we do some bits yeah, for the healthcare system but, there, and it's 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 it is part of the UK. But then there's certain, lots of things that don't count. Right. I know, for instance, <laughs> um, uh, discrimination laws and like oh, they pick and choose. What's yeah, that? That, that's not a thing. Yeah, over yeah but there. It, there, there, there's there's a word for it, and it's it's the old system where the landowners have the rights. Sort of feudal feudal system it's a feudal system yes so what happens is that the, the landowners their children are instantly given the right to become a police officer if they want without training even now yep yep and, hell. <laughs> and, and 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 this guy told me they had one guy was a convicted rapist Christ. and he was he was an, an honorary member he said they're given access to cars they're given a warrant card and a uniform because with, of with no training weird law. because it's a feudal system bloody hell because the landowners have to have, have, yeah, i didn't have, know that was a thing now the feudal system i well, thought that was something like yeah well well again the city of london they don't pay any allegiance to the queen nor do their police force what do you mean right that is called the king edward's coronet yeah you will find that on any serviceman to the crown yeah right it it will be on the hats yeah, of yeah. the coppers everywhere yeah, yeah, yeah. right Every police force, police force in Jamaica, the police force in Australia, yeah. in New Zealand, all have the King Ed, Edward's coronet, that yeah. thing there, right? Yeah. It, except one, the City of London. It has two griffins. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that means it's got no allegiance to the crown. Yeah, so what right? happened there? Right, so they're different. They're, 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 it's not part of the UK. And and when, when what was his name? Um, who was the uh, 1066, the French king who came over? Uh, Harold. Um, Harold was killed. Uh, Harold, sorry, William, the William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror, um, when he took over the UK, he couldn't deal with the city of London, so he left it as its original principality. So it's the city. It's, the, it's the city system. is different. It's totally different. Right. The Queen even needs permission to go in there. Right? It's it's a very when did that what that this since 1066? Oh, because of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I think that would have been rebuked. No, but but there's a lot goes on, and it, right, it yeah. all has a meaning. It yeah. all has a meaning. So um, all of a sudden, this copper has gone out there, and they'd filled in this basement with slurry. So he's excavated it, got teams in, but he's got anthropologists, archaeologists, right? He's done a time team job on it, right? And, and the best cadaver dog, the best cadaver dog, which turned out to be one of the best in the world. So there, right? So they're now sifting this soil, right? The dog gives an indicator, what they call a knock. It gets corroborated by another dog. So therefore, this is human bone, right? 
Uh, it's given then to uh, an anthropologist, so it's excavated by an archaeologist under them conditions. An anthropologist says, that's got collagen on it. That's a human bone. Right. That's a human bone of a child aged between seven and ten, right? So it's now got to go off to a laboratory just to have it sign yeah. stamped, right? Off it goes. So they found it. They find handcuffs, r rusted handcuffs. They fly, find blood staining. They find the bath, right? And of course, it's proved right. What these kids have said, a lot of them have been sectioned. They're drug addicts. Again, what you're saying, one word against the other. And I'm going to go on about MPs shortly. And I, I'm not going to name names, but the names are in that that statement. Um if you've got an MP, and there have been many MPs that have been accused of abuse on children. There's uh, one that's recently gone to prison. Yeah, they? yeah, they're, yeah, they're that's the right. by-election next week because yeah, of that. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's not really made a fuss. They made a fuss of the guy who looked at porn in, in yeah, the, yeah. the Commons. Fair enough. But then the other guy who was so, too close to home. Yeah. Boys. Do, do you know? No, it didn't really make the papers much. Do, do you know why? Because it's called low-hanging fruit. Yeah. They always pick the low hanging fruit. And there is a reason and, and, and it's good you brought out the point because I need to explain that. There's always a pattern, there's always a reason. Okay. Now, all of a sudden Lenny Harper, he, he's done it. He he's cracking it up. He's proved it. Boom. So the bone goes off to the lab in a ratchet seal with a unique seal reference off to the forensic laboratory in London. Um, and that's it. They're, they're on way. But now this is going to expose the whole judiciary, the whole system of uh, the wealthy landowners, everything that were involved that these kids have mentioned. The kids have now, their story's corroborated, yeah. you know. That can't be allowed to happen. So Lenny then gets attacked. Um, there, there's um, an attempt to take his, his granddaughter, I think, into the care system or something. So he's then attacked professionally. The bone comes back. The lab report, when the bone the bone comes back in the bag, it's in a different bag. It's with a ratchet seal with the same number, but a different ratchet seal, which is impossible. It's like DNA, it's impossible. So they've replicated the ratchet seal in a different bag. And and the the analysis is this is coconut shell. And he was kicked off the island. So he's now speaking out and he's going for it, yeah. right? He's been proved right, said an inquiry into it. He's right. And I thought, it's not just me. Yeah, right. It's yeah. another one. Yeah. And then there's a girl, uh, a detective from Manchester with the, the Rochdale cover-ups, Maggie Oliver. She's on the telly. And I'm thinking, my word. So my MP then says, look, because I've gone to my MP and, you know, um, he said, look, you need to be in touch with these people. So through Parliament, I get met up with them. We all tell the same stories. Yeah. And we've all been bullied the same way. We've all had our bank account shut down. We've all had this. Well, this is yet to come, sorry. You know, and they, but they warned me, John, if you speak out, because I haven't officially spoken out right, yet. Right, yeah. If you speak out, you know they're going to shut down your bank. They're going to um, do you for data protection violation, right, which is the one they'll get you on. So they'll say you looked at information you shouldn't have looked at because it's all um, subject to... GDPR and all that. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, but it's also... It's subject to an argument. Did you have authority? Well, I, I believe I did. Well, we believe you didn't, so we're right, you're wrong. So. I'd say GDPR is so... Because I have actually read the um, the, 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 the law and that's just, just to make sure that I could talk back to my bosses sometimes yeah, when I get about this. And it is so vague in some points because if you have a reasonable... Uh, use it's reasonable usage, and yep. you have an intention to, you know, reasonable intention to be able to use that. So then, then that's the thing. But it's, again, it's so vague and nebulous that as to, as to be uh, not not a defence or. Really. But uh, I mean, I think that came out just after. But but anyway, it's the same thing. It's data yeah, it's protection. Thing, yeah. It's exactly you're exactly right. So, and then you know, I'm thinking I'm not alone here. So I thought, right, I'm doing this. I'm going for it. So, and this is weird. Have you ever seen that um, documentary in Line of Duty? In the line, line of Duty? Line of Duty. It's um, not a documentary, the series. Yeah, yeah, drama. Crime series, right? Someone said to me, you've got to watch it. He said, the last one is based on your case. Now, what happened is, I'm like, um, I'm starting to break down. I've had enough of this now. And now I know there's others. I'm like, thank you. Thank God for whistleblowers. Yeah. So I ring up the corruption command and i say i need to speak to a senior detective and it's got to be a woman and i'm like 
oh, okay, what, what's it about? I said, I'm not telling you, but it's serious. You need to know, right? Please, can someone get back to me? So a uniform police constable rings me up. And I went, well, I ain't talking to you. I want a detective, a senior woman. So then a sergeant, uniform sergeant. I said, I don't want a uniform. I'm not having a uniform cop. They're two different jobs. I went, okay. Anyway, it goes back. And then this woman, DCI, calls me up and said, John, come and see me. I went, thanks. So anyway, I go and see her. And funny, weird thing is, as I'm on way to see her at this secure location, I bump into one of the old sergeants that was in charge of me on the vice unit. What are the chances of that, you know? And he starts mentioning about the officers that I'm there to report, you know? And I thought, this is all a bit too odd. Anyway, I, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. I've got an appointment. So I went to Did that raise a red flag with you? Massively, massively. So I then go up and uh, see this woman. She said, I'm perplexed. What, why, why have you stipulated this criteria? I said, because you can't roll up your trouser leg, mom. And she looked at me, she burst out <laughs> laughing. She said, I get it. I get it. Now, when you watch that line of duty, it's a woman senior officer, exactly the same line is said in there for exactly the same offences as, you know, and that came out years after I whistle blew. So I then reported three senior officers for corruption. They said, right, we, we, we're taking this seriously. I said, look, I've got evidence, you know, I've got all these books, I've got, you know, all these things, uh, uh, you know, this is what went on. And they went, right, the first thing is we've got to get you interviewed. And I said, okay, yeah. And I said, look, I, you know, I, it does trigger me and all that. I said, look, if, if you want to after go home, do you just go home? We don't want you triggered. We need you as a witness. So uh, over a period of days, I was interviewed as a witness would be interviewed in, a, in like a, a rape suite, really, what they call a video ABE interview. And they, they took my full disclosure and I've let them have it. I've named everyone, you know, everything I knew, you know, and there was you know, senior officers involved, magistrates involved, you know, I named politicians, everything. It was all there. And this is stuff that I picked up over the course of the, the investigation that I kept to myself because I didn't want to, um, my youngest boy by this time was about 14 years old and, and I, I didn't want to um, jeopardise his placement. And I felt brave, I felt brilliant. So I put that in, I'm thinking, great, I'm, I'm happy now. And... Uh, I then started going sick. I thought, I can't, I'm going to go sick. You know, I, I, it's stressing me out with this. So I've never been sick in my life. My, my doctor was, was a good guy. And so I get signed off sick. Um, and the next thing I then get called in, uh, we want to call in, we want to interview you. I went, okay. And they went, please come in, come in. And I said, right, um, you're under arrest for date protection violation. All right. Um, I then go to the bank. My bank account's been shut down. So I've got about three, they they did me for one, uh, they didn't do me at all, but I got arrested for, sorry, sorry the screen's gone off, gone. I got, I got arrested for one lot of this date protection, but then it kept going, it kept going. So then there was different fences. So they, they've now gone back 15 years through all my emails. Now I'm a victim reporting yeah, yeah. Uh, misconduct in a high office, you know, and covering up the most serious offences. And they found an A4 bit of paper, right, um, where I'd printed out an invoice when I was on night duty to earn a bit of extra cash to pay for my kids because I was skinned so I could cut a tree down because, you know, and bear in mind, I was cutting trees down. I had no insurance, no nothing, you know. It's all, you know, and they're working a chainsaw. and I, There was a lot for me to lose, but I did it to earn the money. So I now get arrested for... for um, not declaring uh, a business, uh, but I had, and they just decided to do me for anyway. I had declared it. Uh, they then said, uh, did me for theft of paper. Um, they then, there was a, there was something to do with, with an informant. Um, and I, I got asked to attend a, um, uh, immigration call hearing for this informant. Um, so then they, they said that I shouldn't have gone when I was summoned by a court. So they tried to give me for misconduct on that. Uh, and I just weren't playing ball. I was, I was just saying, no, 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 you know, I'm not being interviewed. I, I just refused to be interviewed. And then they, they said, we we got to see you again. And then they said, right, um, this one, you're, you, you're going to get 15 years for this. I went, 15 years for what? What have I done? And then they sent, uh, they 
put the um, the sheet before me, like the you know the offence sheet, and it was conspiracy to supply Class A drugs. It's like the yeah. what? And this is honestly, this is the biggest joke of all. This is what a farcical bunch of you know, and this does descend a little bit further before it starts coming up again. And this is why they'll come for you, you know. Um, so I had uh, a good friend of mine that did a lot of covert work with, right? He was a full-time undercover cop. And if you met this guy, you, you'd have no idea. These people go, oh, I smell a cop, man. You'd never know. This guy, he's, he's gone on to become an author, right? And he's brilliant, right? He speaks many languages. Um, but they all go mad. They all, they all lose a plot. Um, He's got too many identities. He was running about five different phones, different identities. He, he speaking in different languages, and he ended up. He had a nervous breakdown, and his world imploded. And of course, while you're producing, they like you, but when you stop producing, they, they go for you. You know, the, the the job turns on you. So no one should ever identify themselves as their career because you're not. You're you. You're not your career. And when you're of no use, they don't care for you. You're nothing. Yeah. You know, blind loyalty. It's foolishness. Your place is at home, not at work. So um, he'd gone mad and he'd gone to live in France and he just needed a friend like we all do sometimes. You know, he was lonely. He was isolated and he wanted to talk to someone. So he, he had no phone. So what he did was he went to an internet cafe and he knew that my, my number, my name, Wedger, I'm the only Wedger anywhere in the world. So if you put in John Wedger at metpolice.co.uk, He's going to get me. Yeah. So all of a sudden, this message comes up. How are you, Wedge? He said, uh, it's so-and-so. And I was like, hiya, oh, yeah, mate. So there's this little dialogue. How are you doing? Now, his legend, his alter, as it were, as um, uh, a couple, was he'd live as a tramp. And he would actually walk the streets and, and urinate himself. He stunk of piss. Jesus Christ. And, and Dedication. He, that's commitment to the park. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you'd have a little dog with him as well. Oh, right. Brilliant. He was, Police dog. <laughs> on, you know, also. You know, <laughs> little Jack Russell dog. And he was tight. He was everywhere yeah. and smelling of piss. And he used to have a little bottle of methadone, right, with his, with his pseudonym name on it and all that, or scratched out or whatever. And that's how he lived. He lived on the streets, this, this dude, you know, and he would infiltrate anywhere and he would get into crack houses, you see, right. as a tramp. And then he'd, he'd get it bugged up and whatnot. And that, uh, he, was, he was good. He was good. And um, so uh, I, I said, you're still living as a tramp. And what he was calling him a jakey, you know, it was a jakey. It's what the Scottish call a tramp, a jakey. I said, you're still living as a jakey? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so uh, listen, I said, uh, he said, I'm coming to London. I said, well, let's meet up. I said, you bring the tenant super and I'll bring the methadone. We'll have a jakey cocktail, right? That was it. So from that, they said, right, we've got you supplying. Jesus Christ. And you're going to get 15 years because we've got the evidence. And when they told me that, I hit the roof. And I said to the guy, you want me to sign for that? I went, yeah. I said, give me the pen because once I sign for it, I'm sticking this straight in your eye. <laughs> so then the next thing, I get threats to kill and threats to murder. I get that as well. So this is what they're doing to, you know, this is where, and in the end I thought, do you know what? I'm not playing this game, right? You can, you can, the lot of you. So I just, that was it. I, I went sick. So now they stopped paying me. So I went to a meeting um, and it was with the former commissioner, Chris Dick. And again, I can name her because this has gone through the court system and I told her everything. And, um, this is the most bizarre meeting, I'm telling you now. Um, it was meant to be me and her. So we, we go in there, and she's at the head of the table like Queen Bee, with nine women all round. And just read between the lines, they're all of the same ilk, or whatever that might mean, you know? Uh, anyway, so there's me, and I think it's just her. And I just think I've had enough of this. So they've agreed to keep paying me. They said that you've, you've suffered an injury on duty. But I said, look, I've done nothing wrong. I'm being attacked here. I said, you know, what gets me is I can take a child out of the care system. I can groom that child. I can have sex with that child. I can introduce that child to my best mate. He can do the same. We can get that child to get her best mate involved 
we can groom her, we can have sex with her, we can make money out of it, and we can keep going. And you've not appointed one dedicated officer in all of London to deal with that appalling crime, and it's massive, as, as, as my evidence proved. Yet if I leant over my fence and called my neighbour, and I said a derogatory term against a minority group, but there was a reason for that, and one of them, she went like that. I said, you'd have me arrested, you'd have me on a register, you'd have me out of my home and everything by the end of the play. And I said, and what's, what, what saddens me even more, I said, I've just gone on about grooming children, young girls, abducting them, having sex with them. Not one of you blinked. Yeah, I said that derogatory term. Yeah. And there's a sharp intake of breath. I said, you know what? We're effed, you know? Yeah. And they were stunned. And she agreed to pay me, but then she lied. She never paid me. So I then had no money. I had no income. I was working on building sites as, as a labourer, you know? But I was doing okay, you know? And of course, I was double the age of the guy I was working for, you know? But I was strong enough, I kept up. But um, then an article was done about me whistleblowing on in the um, one of the the papers and then it ended up in three national newspapers he said john i've got to let you go because i'm paying you cashola and um yeah. i'm gonna mm. uh, they'll be on me you know so i end up losing that right so now i've got my money so they threatened me with my home my job so i've now got nine cases pending that i'm going to take to the crown court so i could lose my job one might stick you don't know you know all nonsense Right, I can't pay my mortgage, so the bank have come around my house. Fair play to the bank. They sent uh, one of their uh, welfare people come around there, and she'd been in the kids' home, and she mm. put her arms around me. She said, ain't no one touching your mortgage. You pay a pound a month, we'll keep it active until you're on your feet. So God bless the bank yeah, for that. Yeah. So NatWest Bank, God bless you. Mm. Although They get I, a bad rep, don't they, they the do. bank? So I'm not a fan of... The no, bank in all but, yeah. but there are some humans yeah. out there. We yeah. can't, we can't, you know, denigrate the whole lot, yeah. right? But the last threat was my children, right? So I'm now on my ass. I, I'm really, I, I can't see a way out of this. You know, I, it, it's hard, right? And the one thing you do is that they do isolate you, right? So they isolate you from from everyone else. So if anyone else wants to get in touch with you, they can't. And so one day I'm working away. Uh, clearing some ground for someone. And I go back to my car, I left my, my phone in my car, I got 50 missed calls. 50 missed calls and they're from my sister, my son, my other son, my mum. I'm like, what? And the next thing, my boy ring, my older boy rings. He goes, where the effing hell are you? I said, what's up? And it's my, my second oldest. He's in hospital. He said, he's in hospital. He's in a coma. I'm like, what? He said, he's in a bad way. They think he's going to die. And he's been taken to uh, a hospital a long way. You know, it's almost 100 miles outside of London. So I'm covered in mud and smoke and all that. Dirt, you know, because there's a fire I've been digging. And I bomb over there in my, my little car. And I get there and my, you know, they're about to operate my son. So they say, look, he's, he's broke his neck and he had exactly the same injury as that. Oh, yeah. Exactly the same injury. And the same vertebrae. And they said, look, we're, we're not hopeful. Um, but the surgeons come up from London let's just pray so go home and we'll, we'll update you anyway the operation went ahead he, he was alive so he's in intensive care now and he's in a high dependency unit right and he's there for quite a while quite a while um, so I I said to one of the girls uh, that I used to work with uh, and she's in contact with um, the senior officers, you know, that are putting this case against me, this corruption. So again, the case I've reported has been taken off the Met Police and given to to Operation, come to me in a minute, been to a national unit, and then it sort of got lost in the system. And the only the only record of it then was the Daily Mail actually mentioned it in their disclosure about cases coming forward post Jimmy Savile, and mine was in there. Uh, but whenever I tried to make an inquiry on an update, I just kept getting fobbed off. Oh yeah, well we can't find it at the moment. It's there. It's gone to, it's gone to this national investigation team. It'll come to me in a minute. It'll so, come. so again, they were bouncing it around. 
bumped. Yeah, to a different been department. bumped. Yeah. And what they'd done was that the, the officer who threatened me, right, because the allegations were so severe, he should have been brought in, cautioned, arrest, you know, arrested under caution, uh, and interviewed, right? That's what it should have been, that's the process. They rang him up on the phone, and they said, uh, is what John Major saying true? And he went, no, put the phone down. All right, finish. And that's, and, and, and that's what happened. So I then get a call. I win my son in the hospital. Um, he's, he's saying he's on full life support. I go home. I sit down and for the first time I think, right, oh, I'm gonna have a can of beer. So I'm in behind the can of lager and I've opened it and I just took a swig, my phone went. And this hospital said, Can you come back? Can you come back? I was like, Well, okay, so if you can bring someone, bring someone, but we need you back. So I've got no petrol, you know, I'm, I'm literally on the red. The hospital was 65, 70 miles away. So I was smashing it down there. Uh and I get there, and when I get there, and anyone who's been on the ICU unit, so we had Thing in there they're they're closed you can't people can't just walk in you've got to be a nominated family member i mean usually only allowed two family members and you you become like quite a, a group because it's a roller coaster you know one minute you'll be talking there'll be an improvement in your your loved one and then the next minute they'll be at death's door and then it goes like that and then all of a sudden the consultant will come in ask to speak to someone and they'll be taken into this chaplain the, the chapel and then you just hear loads of screaming and mm. you never see him again because they've obviously yeah. died so i go in there and there's either three three consultants and they usher me into the the chapel room and they went we're sorry we've lost your son mm. um he his heart stopped um we we were on him for seven and a half minutes we estimate by the time we started 10 minutes he's been clinically dead we have managed to get uh, an algorithm back so he's on full 100 percent dependency absolute 100 percent dependency because he's on the, the full lung thing this is what annoyed me about this covid stuff they've gone about um these um ventilators they destroy your lungs and when my son was in that hospital um, most of the people died from um, from pneumonia. It's a big, it's a big thing. It's yeah. a big. They died from pneumonia, lung infection. They die, and it explodes when it's hundred percent explodes the alveoli. It just destroys the lungs. So they're on a limited time span anyway, and they try and reduce the ratio, the percentage, to get independent. But they said, look, he's been dead for ten minutes. His body was so broken anyway. He was paralysed anyway. Um, and now with this, we're going to give you five days on full, clinically he's dead, on full, um, vent, you know, full resuscitation. And then we're going to, we're going to turn off and you can appeal it. I said, we'll get a solicitor down there. And I said, no, look, you've, you know, you've done what you've done and credit where it's due, you know. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I think it, it, what's happening with the casualty, it's a Mickey tape, but these ICUs, they, they were good, you know. Oh, the, good. The, 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 the more uh, I've, been, I've had a relative who's having this and uh, and she's yeah she she has she's luckily she's come out of a, a ICU uh, recently but uh, yeah the, the the more dedicated care people I noticed the difference between you know it's all good and the NHS does a great job I have noticed the difference between people on a ward yeah. and then people in the sort of you know the the, the ICU and the more yeah, yeah. dedicated you know they they, they are excellent fantastic yeah. yeah yeah I had no complaints so I said can I stay with him and they yeah but you've got your your day so I've rung my mum up said mum we've lost him uh, but I'm here and at home one of my boys um don't know where he was he'd stay around the friends but my, my oldest son was there and my youngest who's 15 and so I'm there three days and when when they turn him and clean him I go in the chapel and I pray and I'm praying and on the third day I was broken so I went in the chapel and I, and it was a multi-faith thing because they got uh, Indonesian stuff they got Muslim stuff they got Buddhists they got all sorts you know so I'm praying to God and I said God and I got angry I got really angry and I said I am fed up of picking the pieces up all my life just because men can't be bothered to look after their own children because women neglect their kids and rather go to the pub or with men than look after their own kids and I was 
cussing single parents. I was cussing dysfunctional, proper cussing them. I was going for it in this chapel. I must sound like a nutcase. And I was screaming and I said, God, don't expect me, don't expect me to go out there and save other children if I can't save my own child. I can't save my own child, then I ain't doing this no more. I'm not helping these kids no more. That's that parent's job, not mine. Why should I do it when they can't be bothered? These are selfish people. I was letting them have it. The parents of all these kids that have been let down, they were getting it, you know? I was screaming. I was angry with God. And I said, God, please give me my son and you've got me. I'll do your job. I said, you was, you was a shepherd that left the flock to get the stray one. I'll do that for you, but give me my son, please. And I was, I'd had enough. I'd had enough of just being destroyed by what I see as an evil system and everything. And, and these threats were made, you know, your children. You know, so, and it does take a little bit of turn a bit deeper. So I, I go back and, and I just pray and I hold in my boy's hand and he, he opens his eyes. He opens his eyes and he looks at me and I went, move your toes. Cause it's so hot in there. They, they're basically, they just put like a little blanket over them. You know, they're, they're in their pants and pipes and tubes and anyone, I, I don't know, you, you might not be old enough, but there was a case years ago of a girl called Leah Betts who took the, the overdose of ecstasy and her father said, they need to see this picture. And it was her before she died with pipes. And that was my son. It was on billboards, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was my son and no parent should ever see this. And it was everywhere, machines, pipes, everywhere. It's like that. And he's opened his eyes and I said, move your toe. And he, his left foot went like that. I went, he ain't paralyzed. I said, move the other one. He went like that. I went, grab my hand. It was this weak grab. No, the left hand he couldn't. He's got paralysis there. The right hand he grabbed it. I went, son, I love you. And he, he sort of nodded to try and say it back, but he was tired, you know? And and this nurse, you couldn't believe it. She went, oh my God, oh my God. And the heartbeat started coming into play and and all that. I said, I'm going home. She went, but your son's come back. I said, I, I need to go home. But I told the colleague I work with, look, tell the senior officers on this unit to leave me alone because I'm I've lost my son. And if they come near me, I'm going to kill him. I'll stab him. I'm going to, I'll do anything. They come for my kids, I'll kill them. And so she did, right? So I get home and as I drive home, I have a thing where I can go past my road. I always drive past my road, not so much now, but I used to. And there's a car parked in my road and I've gone past it. And I've looked around and I know that that's a CID car. I know, two guys in it, I, I know. And I go back and then as I go back, I see him getting out, walking towards my house and my oldest boy's there engaging with them and um what he's actually doing they're asking for me and he's telling them to 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 f off no he's loyal you know good boy so i've gone around the back gone in and my other boy's gone to the shops and so i thought i can't let him take this so i said it's me you want he went well your boy said i said i'm matt one my boy said i'm the one you want and they went oh well he's really loyal to you i said look don't, don't, leave that what do you want and they, they got out their warrant cards they said uh you're under arrest for child neglect and abandonment. Yeah. I went, what are you on about? And he went, you've left your 15 year old son home alone. I went, well, he's with him. He said, we need to, we need to speak to your son, you know, when you're under arrest. And that's, that's the depths I'll go to while my son, this was under, this was under the, 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 um, guidance and authority of Crystal Dick, who, you know, they've kicked out now. Good, good. You know, um, Okay. Anyway, that's uh, that. I could go on and on about that, but um, and and I thought, well, this ain't happening. But what happened? Something changed. This was my path to to being a born again Christian. Um, I have a covenant now with God, with Jesus. And the one thing about being a Christian is you swap um, fear for faith. I had no fear. They didn't frighten me. The fear went. There was nothing they could do. I weren't frightened. Even if I went to prison, I weren't frightened. I had no fear. It'd gone. And there was a calmness in me. So I took them on. And I took them on. And I said, before you lay a finger on me, you listen to my story. And I told this detective sergeant what had happened. And he said, they've lied to us. You know that. He 
He said, they told us that this, that, and the other, that I'd abandoned him with no food. Uh, and he said, and you've been stitched up here. He said, we're going. And his colleague went to do his notes. He said, no, we're off. And he'd come and he put his arms around me. He went, good luck with everything, son. And I went, if I come to it, can I rely on you? Um, he went, yeah, here's the log number. Um, and of course, when I went, they, my solicitors went to get the log number. They they said, oh, we can't find it and all that. But <laughs> typical, uh, because I went on to, to take, take them to court. But my life changed then. And then from there, um, I started taking them on. I started fighting them. They didn't want to give me my pension. I, I was awarded my pension. I had to go to um, uh, uh, a hearing about my medical pension with these doctors, and, and I let them have it. I proper let these doctors have it. And they said, right, that's it. We, we are going to pension you off. But then Cressida Dick decided to take it to a judicial review, so I didn't get my pension. She lost that. I won that. So I get pensioned off. The Crown Prosecution Service threw out every single case against me, threw out every single case, bang, off that went, you know. And and then I was out of place. And it was like, brilliant, what am I going to do? Um, but then through this, I started linking in with victims and survivors. Most of them have been in and out of prison. Some were, were notorious gangsters. And I thought, I'm going to use my skills, my interview skills, to get their stories out. If I struggled being a, a policeman, how must they have struggled mm. being someone who's probably illiterate, comes from, mm. from the fringes of society, you know, areas where there is that alienation and we don't talk to the police, they would have absolutely battered them. So I thought, this is what I'm going to do. So I started approaching people and they started giving me stories. And it started coming forward, and the stories were all the same. They were all the same. Taken into care because of dysfunctionality at home, put into care system, sexually abused. Sexual abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse, sexual abuse. Reform schools, sexual abuse in the reform schools. Back then, they had bore stalls, you know, and they were sexually abused by staff in bore stalls. Uh, from there, they went on to approved centres. They then went, they went on to prison, young offenders to prison, and the whole system. A whole system was repeating, repeating, repeating. And then every now and then, out of 10 people I'd interview, and I was doing it on my phone. I didn't know what to do. I was just podcasting. I'd become the fastest growing podcaster on Facebook in 2018. I had a million followers a month, a million. You know, it was incredible. It was just like this whole world exploded in front of me, and I was inundated, and it was boom, boom. I'd go down the street, and people would stop and say, I was in the kids' home. I'll come and talk. You know, I've had coppers come up to me in the street and hug me. Thank you for speaking out. You know, tramps coming up. I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Homeless people coming up saying, thank you. I, I Once I was in central London and a homeless guy, a big raster, come up and he went, oi, man, John Wedge, I went, yeah, he went, come here, man. And he gave me a massive hug. He went, I love you. I hate the old Bill, but I love you. And next to him, this copper was there in full uniform. He went, can I give you a hug as well? And I said to Rasta, no offence, but his hug means more because there's more of a bridge I've had to cross to get to him than it is yeah. to get to you. I said, to get there? He went, yeah, yeah, he said. So did you did you become a born, born, uh, born again Christian or was you really yeah. Christian? Yeah. Well, well I, I was brought up in a Catholic background. Right. Um, but the, the more I started speaking to people, that they'd had the same experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a difference between, see, see, Catholicism and Protestant is religion. Christianity is not religion. No, right. You know, it's, it, it is different. It's fundamentally different. It's Jesus, you know. See, what compounded it then was the fact that one in ten of the people coming forward had been abused in what's called satanic ritual abuse. And I'd come across it in the police, but voodoo, Abuse, sexual abuse through voodoo and through a Jamaican thing called Opia and Santeria, you know, these, uh, but they're all the same. It's a witchcraft. They're all the same. They all worship the same gods. The ceremonies are all the same. The, the, the demons are all the same. And they started coming forward and it, it took the abuse to another level. I started then hearing of human sacrifices and things like that, you know, and even the chief constable, he spoke out because he investigated Ted Heath for the abuses in Operation Conifer. And he even said on Sky News that Ted Heath was involved in satanic abuse, as was Jimmy Savile. Um, and they started saying all the same thing, but there was something 
fundamentally difference between a victim and a survivor of care home abuse and a victim of survivor of satanic ritual abuse. And what it was, was the ones from the, the SRA had a thing called DID, which was multiple personality, d disassociated identity disorder. And it's through the torture and the torment, and they were abused in the most appalling, and it causes a fragmentation of the mind. So they've got multiple personalities. And it's... It's not just sex and whatnot, you're torture, it's torture. It's people. torture, and it fra fragments the mind. <clears throat> and these people start coming forward because I started speaking out about this. It was unbelievable. You know, they were coming out from all over. And, you know, I, I was with one on Friday, and I've never had anything so appalling. And then I was given a document called the Rains List, R-A-I-N-S, and it's referred to in the evidence there, and it's Ritual Abuse Information Network Support. And it's, I should have brought it along with me, actually. And, it, and it's a document by a doctor called Dr. Joan Coleman, who's a, a, a psychotherapist for the Maudsley Hospital. And when she was dealing with abuse survivors, she started seeing the same thing. There's a fundamental difference between accounts of people that have been neglected and sexually abused and these that have been subject to this ritualistic abuse. So she started taking her accounts. And not only were, were their accounts similar, the venues were similar. So if, if a survivor mentioned a name independently, if three of them, so two or more, mentioned the same name, she wrote it down. She did an extended list with no corroboration and one with multiple corroboration. So she, she ended up with this list and these names. There were so many people corroborated it, 16 pages of names of celebrities and, and everything else. And lo and behold... One of the bosses from my old police unit on the vice is named on it. That's it. Oh. And, and they've never been able to discredit this document. It stands on its own in its honesty. And even to this day, it's still being corroborated. It's a phenomenal document. So that's, so that's the new thing. That, what we, we said before, what's your, um, what enjoyment are you getting out of life? Um, <laughs> and I don't mean that to be funny. I mean, yeah, just, yeah, no, clearly. This is, yes, it's very yeah, heavy yeah, stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, every now and then, you get a call in, a vocation. I mean, I um, it's not that it's a life of servitude. It's just it's just what's happened to me. I mean, I now I used to despise certain groups, right? And, and I'm not going to say this with honesty. Um, I couldn't go near handicapped people. I couldn't. They freaked me out. I now work with severely, severely handicapped people. Right? There was always a, a big disconnect between the police and the traveller community. I now work closely with the traveller communities. I've, I've been for meals on, on gypsy sites, work closely with them. Um, and, and my life has changed. My whole value system has changed. My judgment has gone. And it's as if I needed to do this for whatever the next chapter in life is. But I've uncovered something. It's not me. There's people that have gone before me about the sheer extent of this abuse. Yeah. And it's not something you can walk away from. I get messages, thousands of them, thanking me. I mean, a lot of what I do now is very covert. I'm nowhere near as public as I was because I also have become a target for very damaged people, you know, that were that, that are totally deluded. And again, there is a reason for that. But And there's a lot of nasty people. So there's a lot of pro-satanic groups that don't like me. I've had dead animals left outside my house. I've had chalk, chalkings of, of, of sigils, satanic sigils put outside my house and, and all sorts of stuff like that. But, but you know. But, so again, why, how do you keep saying, yeah. what do you, I know you do, you, you jump in lakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I do my cold water swimming. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm capable with my hands. Mm. I do a lot, you know, I can do a lot of building work. I do a lot of advocating and I get a lot out of helping. Yeah, yeah. So much okay, out of helping. Yeah, yeah. My value system is not for money, right? It's not. I, I was walking along the other day and there was a Ferrari convertible and there was two men, they were older than me. They went, wow, look at that. They, they got a hard on for this car. And I thought, you couple of plums, is that what you value in life? My value isn't in things like that. Yeah. You, even in the police, they couldn't bribe me. I was offered £80,000 cash to leave the Turkish Mafia alone. It was there. There's nothing they have I want. I don't want their cars. I'm not interested. I don't get turned on by cars. It means nothing. I don't give a flying shite for mm. footballers. It don't mean nothing to me. Celebrities, what I've seen enough of the filth they're involved in, I don't see uh, 
a guitarist uh, uh, as a man or, or, or a rock star, or I don't iconically a hero worship these people, but there are people I do. And the people, there's, there's a guy, for example, called Gennady Mokhanenko, and he's, he's, a, he's a pastor out in, in the Ukraine. And uh, he's an ex boxer, he's an ex soldier, and now he's a priest. And he goes out and he saves the street kids. And they did a documentary on this guy called Almost Holy. I was in tears. I thought, I've got to meet this guy. This, this, this guy's a god. This is brilliant. And I, the pleasure I got out of it, yes, last week, yesterday was something else, but last week I advocated. I went to a meeting with social services for a guy who's struggling. He's he, He's been in prison for serious crimes and he's doing his best. He's got a young family. He's come from immense trauma. He got triggered and he kicked off and social services got caught up in it all because the police got called. And his instinct is damaged teenager, like we mentioned about the snowman thing, run, 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 run. And he wants to run away and take his kids, but he's going to get nicked. And if if he gets nicked, his kids get to off him in the whole melee, someone's going to get hurt, and he'll be in prison his life, you know, never see his kids. But it was so easily remedied. He just needed that bigger brother, that 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 understanding uncle, maybe the father he never had. But that's why I'm saying, ask you about how are you, because you haven't really got anyone to run to as a such. No. How do you feel you're doing? Are you all right? Yeah. You go to the gym. I, 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 I do my training. Yeah. I do my swimming. Um, you podcasting. Basically. I do you podcasting do a, lot a lot, you know, and I, I do my gardening. I walk my dog. I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing my book. You yeah, know, we I mentioned that last time. I'm, I'm underway that. I do a lot of my campaign letters and things like that. And and I'm happy. I'm and happy. also, you've got some other stuff. I mean, we're not going to talk into you, but you've got some big, you're going to be starting doing your own thing soon, which I won't say any more than that. But you've got something else coming up in the very near future, yeah, which yeah. is another nice step forward for you. Yeah, yeah. But Because I, I, I just want to make sure you're happy, John. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, but I am because this, you know, it, it, it's one of the things, and, and I might come across as someone who, who's sort of um, trauma bonded or whatever, but it, it's what's called being driven. Yeah. And and it's not a good subject. It's not. But in order for it to be healed, it needs exposing yeah. to the light. And it is dirty. And it needs to be. It needs to be cleansed. And and some can't handle it. And there's others that can. And Well, you're just one of them people that had to go first with it all, unfortunately. That was your burden and your gift, that you had to be the one that but, went off-road. And But listen, Theo, there's an old saying, out of pain comes compassion. Mm. Right? And, and those that do go out there and set up these charities and help, they understand pain. They know it. Mm. You know, they, they know what it causes, you know. And I know what happens when, when kids are abandoned and neglect. I know. And out there, there's wolves. And they're praying. And this is this ain't a clean world. It's a bad world. It's an unforgiving world. It's a violent world. It's not nice. And it's better that I know that yeah, the yeah, pitfalls yeah, yeah. than I don't, you know. And it's like how, how I see, because I, I, I get some people, I don't preach my belief system but sometimes someone asks me and i tell them mm. right especially people that have been caught up in satanic abuse i said there is a way you don't need to be in bondage to this and i said you know there are rules that god's put in place and i said if you look at it this way a dog you get a dog you love that dog you love that so much that dog but you can't get through to it so you have to discipline that dog to sit up the roadside to obey your command not to chase the cat because a dog it will see a squirrel running across the road but it won't see an articulated lorry because it won't and it's the same with us we don't see what's out there the, the demonic influences that are out there we don't but god does and he puts his rules in don't go down that line don't get caught in that because you're going to bring things on yourself that are so bad you won't know how to come out of it so he gives us rules, and, and and with with the with the SRA stuff and all that. Let's be frank. This predates Christianity. This is ancient. This is Babylonian. This isn't something that a load of witches in a new forest conjured up a week ago because it's a new agey way of believing. No, this this is real and it works and it's been about and it's consistent across humanity. You know. Well, um, we're gonna have to end things there, but it's because it's opening up another door. But um, did you want to say something? No. Oh, just yeah, Charles has been playing. Sorry, yes, um, sciatica. But you've, uh, you've, yeah, it's it's a it's a an amazing thing you've gone through and stayed with. 
and pop down. Yeah, because every time I see you, I think he still looks young. He doesn't look <laughs> haggard. Do you know what I mean? He's got that sort of boyish youth. It I think, does look like it's hollowed you out. Yeah, so it's amazing that it's sort of you've got yourself through it in the condition you have. It, it, it's a pleasure. It's a gift. Yeah, you know? yeah, it, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, yeah. And and you know, one I'm breathing, I'll keep going, right. and I, and I enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah. And it is a struggle, but it's it's good. Well, as we said, that you've got the, there's other things happening for you now that will probably come out in the next month, so everyone should keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you very much, John, for going through all that. I know you've said the stories before elsewhere, but you to to be able to tell it again to a different type of people, um, it's a it's it's a gift, and the world the world's very lucky to have you, John. Oh, and bless. I'm as I think when I actually when I met him, I said I I, I feel privileged to have got to have met you because you're the real deal without well, any of the well, well well it's quite bizarre because um a lot of my friends now are ex-criminals you know and, and travelers and all sorts and and i'm writing a book and a real good friend of mine is is quite a notorious ex-criminal called chris lambriano the and craze yeah, the, yeah, like, from the crime. you know and he went away for the murder the conspiracy or, or the you know the joint enterprise and murder of jack the happy Bitty. And I was telling him this, I said, Chris, there's, there's only a couple of coppers I'm in touch with, the rest of them are all criminals. <laughs> and he said, you got right, like you said to me, he said, you got right your book. Yeah. And he, I said, yeah, I'm going. And he said, call it ironic. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> yeah. yeah I it, said, yeah. yeah. He said, make sure you call it ironic. <laughs> and it is. Yeah, My life is it, yeah. nothing but ironic. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm glad you're saying, John, if, if that can be a compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, listen, thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about we're doing some other stuff with you. So, the, but as I said, there's some other stuff with John happening very soon. So you need to keep an eye on him, keep on his socials, and uh, you'll definitely be hearing from him again soon. John, watch this space. Thank you very much, thank you, brother. Bless. Cheers, you mate. Cheers. <laughs> oh, yeah.